Welcome everybody to Both Sides of the Conversation. I'm John Henry, Executive Director. Today is Sunday. So you know what that means. We're going to have another Sunday conversation. Today is a very important conversation as we close out this month talking about breast cancer, the risk, prevention, and what kind of support is needed in our community. We know there's a lot of resources that is needed. This month, we've been tackling domestic violence, violence in our community, as well as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And again, you know, we're going to keep pushing through these conversations all throughout the year as needed. We're going to continue to highlight uh, some of the issues that's taking place when we look at the medical industry, when we look at the environments that our communities um, folks are living in and how they impact us uh, with these type of cancers. But again, great show today um, and phenomenal guests um, here today. So just looking forward uh, to having this community conversation on this Sunday. Again, it's always important to convene in space. Uh, to have these difficult conversations. Speaking of difficult conversations, community, we're going to be having a very, very important but difficult conversation about surveillance in our community and AI and how it impacts our community. Some of the things that some of us don't know and do know um, about these technologies and how it impacts community. Um, I think it's something that our community needs to be very aware, very conscious of, and have a real understanding and education around some of these uh, surveillance programs and some of the things that's going on, not in just San Francisco, but across this country, and uh, more and more community folks need uh, to be involved. I know the voice is not here, but we have the amazing Ayo. Ayo, welcome back today. Holla at the people. Good afternoon, community. Happy Sunday. I hope everybody is well rested and getting looking forward to a great week. We do have an amazing show today as we close out, like John said, our Domestic Violence and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, it's not just about this month. It's an ongoing epidemic that we need the information out there to our community. We have a great panel today of some very great women and inspirational, informative information for you guys, um, survivors and uh, healthcare officials alike. Um, so looking forward to getting the show started today. Man, thank you very much. And I know Mark is out today, but we will be holding it down for the community, for folks out there just tuning in for the first time or watching. If you would like to ask questions, make comments, please use the live chat function on our YouTube channel or if you on our Facebook group, our page, you can use uh, the chat function. We'll get those questions and comments up on the screen as we go out to today's show. A number of things is happening. Phenomenal events took place um, over the weekend. Just want to give a huge shout out to the Village Project, Miss Adrian Williams put on a phenomenal, phenomenal event um, the other night here on Friday night, um, you know, supporting our seniors. Again, we always talk about bridging the gap between the elders and the young people in the community, and that work is continuous. So shout out to the Village Project, an amazing event that they pulled off. And shout out to all of the amazing organizations that continue to galvanize the community with their events, bringing resources, information to our community. It is much needed. So with that being said, just thank you for all the people out there. Please go subscribe, follow us on all of our social media handles at both sides of the conversation. Check us out, see what's going on. We got some amazing things coming up in the next couple of weeks as we head into our winter months um, into Thanksgiving and Christmas. A lot of giveaway, a lot of give back that we're going to be doing to impact community. Again, the weather is getting colder. The time is getting uh, shutting down earlier. So do your part community to make sure you look out for your unhoused brothers and sisters in any way uh, you can. If that's just giving back clothes or food, uh, support some of the food banks, different things of that nature as communities are being impacted dramatically. Um, we talk about economics and what's going on, not only with this war, but what's happening across this country. Folks are being pressed. A lot of folks out here looking for help, support. So make sure you do your part to reach out and help those folks as these nights get colder and the winter months kick in with the rain and the snow across this country. Don't forget about those who really might be in need. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump into our news and then some of the announcements that um, I will be getting us through um, here today. So we just want to start off. Yesterday was a very emotional and impactful day as protesters all across the Bay Area here in San Francisco as well blocked the intersections to uh, enter uh, the freeway as um, folks were out rallying, um, asking for ceasefire in the Israel war. A lot of Palestinian um, folks came out waving their flags in support of 
um, ceasefire. Again, as this war in Israel is heating up, more things is happening. But folks all across the Bay Area showed up. I know a lot of folks were impacted, okay? A lot of folks was upset because they couldn't get on the freeway. Traffic was long. It took people a longer time. Um, but that's the purpose of protest, to bring awareness and conscience to people, make things difficult, not business as usual, to understand and get involved, to see what's going on, not only globally, but here locally. We have a lot of issues that's impacting our community. Get involved, community. This is the time as we approach approach the election season. A lot of political things happening. Folks got to get involved and make sure that their voices are heard. Also in San Francisco, San Francisco supervisor uh, advocating to ban all right turns on red lights. Uh, supervisor Dean Preston is putting a bill together to ban right turns on all red, red lights as so many folks have been hit by cars, turning, not fully stopping. A lot of issues um, with these uh, making these right turns on red lights. Um, so this is going up. A lot of folks are going to be hearing about it. I don't know. Community, you tell me you think it's OK or not. I don't know. I think we all need to slow down a little bit out there, um, but they are definitely proposing um, to put those um, measures in place as so many pedestrians have been hit crossing our crosswalks here in San Francisco. Also, the San Francisco Anti-Open Task Force um, could be charging dealers with homicide. I don't know if you all know in California, there's already been four cases of drug dealers who have been um, charged with murder uh, for some of the folks who have died using fentanyl. This fentanyl issue across San Francisco and across this country is out of control, okay? It is out of control. We just have to say what it is. It is out of control. So again, they are trying to put measures together uh, to find ways to discourage people from enacting and drug selling in our city. And um, one of the um, one of the things that they're trying to do is implement charging folks if someone died from that drug use to charge those dealers with that crime. I know some folks say it's extreme, um, but what do you do when you have hundreds of people dying daily? Okay. I was just down in the Tenderloin yesterday and just driving through there, seeing the amount of people laid out on the concrete, overdose. I mean, it's just terrible. We got to do something. It's going to take a lot of us, the community, community organizations to fix the substance abuse problem, not just here in San Francisco, but across Across this country. And it's a real thing um, that we have to um, look into and make sure that we are part of. Also, uh, Gaza received the largest aid of shipments so far as the death total is, is uh, exceeded 8,000. Um, Israel widens military offenses as they are on the ground now moving in and out of there. Again, tragic situation to see what's going on. Um, but again, those folks are being impacted. And again, I tell people all across uh, the world in here, you know, a lot of folks, we forget about the things that we are still graced for, you know, even with all the news of fentanyl and substance abuse, the things that's going on here locally, um, we are still a funded opportunity um, that don't have bombs dropped on us to not have folks uh, kidnapping and hijacking our community. So again, when we go to complain and think about things that are not right, uh, just remember, we are still um, at a place where things um that affect others in this world is not affecting us here. So stay humble community and understand that there's somebody out there dealing with something very, very worse than what you're dealing with. Folks are fleeting, don't know where they're going to go, can't get out of their country. Very tragic stuff. So again, stay humble community. Let's think about how worse it could be. Also, a 22-year-old was charged in Tampa um, in a shooting that killed two and injured 16. Again, these gun violence in our community is just out of control. This weekend, this past week in San Francisco, had two more women lose their life to domestic violence with guns. Again, we got to continue to have this conversation about guns. We know last week we had the guy in Maine uh, shoot and kill 18 people and a lot more injured. Uh, we got to have a real conversation about mental health, uh, gun control. What are we going to do? How are we going to pull this together to make sure that community folks uh, can have safe spaces and can convene in spaces without having to be worrying about um, being shot uh, because somebody with mental health, someone on substance abuse, or someone just enraged. Uh, we have to do a little bit more with um, when we talk about conflict management and understanding the temperament of folks. And I know some people are going to argue this is why we need surveillance. This is why we need these technologies. And again, you know, I'm just going to say on both sides, there's a, util a utilization of these tools, but there's also some things that we have to also be aware of with using these tools. So with that being said, that is our news. I'm going to pass it over to Miss Io to get us through the events. Community, this is what's going on. Be patient out there. I know it's a lot of events, but we got to get this out to the community so y'all can't say. Y'all didn't know what was going on and how to connect with community. With that being said, Io, take over the events. Let the community know what's going on. 
Lots of great events coming up with Halloween week happening. Uh, we have BMO Magic is seeking donations of unopened candy bags to be passed out at their Halloween event. Please drop off any unopened bags of candy out by October 30th to B Magic at 1275 Fairfax Avenue, Suite 201, and to Mo Magic at 1050 McAllister Street in San Francisco. Collective Impact and BMO Magic presents the Halloween Horror House on Tuesday, October 31st from 4 to 6 p.m. at Ella Hill Hutch, 1050 McAllister Street in San Francisco. Dreamkeeper presents a pathway to yourself. Discover Day on November 11th from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Visitation Boys and Girls Club, located at 251 Leland Avenue in San Francisco. Black Futures Lab is offering grants up to $250,000 to Black-led organizations focused on educating, activating, and motivating Black male voters. The application deadline is November 1st, 2023, and the grant winners will be announced November 14th. Please apply now at the link below. Latino Task Force is providing Section 8 housing waitlist application assistance on Friday, October 27th and November 3rd at LTF Excelsior Hub, 4834 Mission Street in San Francisco. This will be from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Join Into Action for the Bayview Uncorked Southeast San Francisco celebration on Saturday, November 11th, 1 to 5 p.m. at Pier 70, Building 12, located at 822nd Street in San Francisco. The Rafiki Coalition is hosting the Black Business Expo on November 4th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. The Rafiki Coalition located at 601 Cesar Chavez Street in San Francisco. San Francisco Early Care and Education Advocacy Coalition hosts the second annual ECE Advocacy Retreat on Saturday, November 4th, 2023 from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. MNC Leland Rossi Hall, 362 Cap Street in San Francisco. Join Everybody Read San Francisco for their Family Book Club launch on November 4th, 2023 from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Chase Center. It will be a day of fun, games, books, and giveaways with special guests, Dr. Booker and Areba Maeve, RSVP at the link below. Big Bucks Racing presents the final 1 8th mile Bucks Race at Sacramento Raceway. This is an all weekend event from November 3rd to November 5th. Race fees will be collected at the front gate. HCV Section 8 Lottery Waitlist opening opens Monday, October 23rd, starting at 8 a.m. PST and closes November 6th at 5 p.m. Applications not submitted by 5 p.m. Apply online only at the link below. Latino Task Force is providing Section 8 housing waitlist application assistance on Monday, October 23rd. 30th and November 6th at LTF Mission Hub 701 Alhambra Street in San Francisco. This will be from 11 a.m. till 7 p.m. Murray's Athletic Development Excellence Foundation presents their interactive speaker series November 9th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Lincoln High School, located at 2162 24th Street in San Francisco. Into Action announces the Black Cultural Preservation Mini Grant Cycle 2, opening on October 10th, closing at November 10th for, for December 1st through February 28th, 24. To apply, please see the link below. The San Francisco Bay Area Theater Company invites you to the third New Roots Theater Festival for six performances over three days, Friday sun through Sunday, November 10th through the 12th at Bravo Theater Center, 2781 24th Street in San Francisco. Live stream options are available. The African American Shakespeare Company announces its 23 to 24 season beginning of Death of a Salesman, Saturday, October 28th through Sunday, November 12th at the Taub Atrium Theater, 401 Van Ness Avenue in San Francisco. The four series season subscription also includes Cinderella, Pipeline, and The Merchant of Venice. Purchase tickets for one show or the series at the link below. San Francisco Recovery Theater presents Reflections in Black 2023 New Roots Theater Festival. One weekend, 15 performances, 50 Bay Area Artists, November 10th through the 12th at Brava Theater in San Francisco. 
Dogs Club presents the Dogs Got Your Back Basketball Tournament for boys and girls, third through eighth grade. Register your school or club team for $325 with a three-game guarantee. The tournament will be held at the City College of San Francisco. Join Rafiki Coalition for a visit the Presidio, walk by the Bay Trail, and visit the Golden Gate Bridge Visitor Center on November 13th from 9.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. The free shuttle leaves Rafiki located at 601 Cesar Chavez Street at 9.30 a.m. Free lunch will be provided, and for more information, please see the link below or text the number below as well. The San Francisco Public Health Foundation, in collaboration with San Francisco Department of Public Health, is requesting RFBPs for the SDDT 2024 Healthy Community Support Grants. Apply now through November 16th. For more information, please hit the link below. The Fall 2023 Community Creatives Workshops welcome you to free family fun event on November 18th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Pelega Recreation Center located at 500 Felton Street in San Francisco. Participants can learn to improve new skills with any of our specialized workshop topics as in sewing, hair braiding, self-defense, and beading for jewelry workshops and enjoy free food and prizes. Fathers to Founders presents the Black is Beautiful Health Resort on November 18th, 2023 from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the Tenderloin. We are seeking service providers, screeners, testers, and educators. AAACC asks you to join them to celebrate Black music event. Save the date, Saturday, November 18th. This the Small Business Saturday hosts holiday gift shopping on November 25th from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the Black, 1567 Fillmore Street in San Francisco. Visit the Farmer's Market located at the Southeast Community Center at 1550 Evans Avenue in San Francisco every Thursday now through November 30th, 3 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. They accept cash, debit, and EBT. Mackie's Corner presents Mackie's Corner's Xmas on, no, on December 3rd from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Food, dance, Black Santa, and presents. This event is to celebrate those who have been impacted by suicide. San Francisco NAACP celebrates 95 years of service at the annual Freedom Fund Gala December 1st at the Hyatt Regency Grand Ballroom located at 5 Embarcadero Center in San Francisco. Single tickets are $150 and tables of 10 are $1,500. The Black Female Project is hosting Invest in You, a transformative leadership program December 1st and 2nd via Zoom with Charmaine McClare. Use coupon winning 2023 for $1,000 off. OMI Cultural Participation Projects, The Lion King, Friday, December 8th, 7.30 p.m. at the Orpheum Theater, 1192 Market Street in San Francisco. Walter's Wellness Group invites you to the restorative retreat on December 9th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. for a one-day retreat where a team of experts, facilitators led by Dr. Kathia Walters will guide you through a transform excuse me, transformative experience designed to help you get into your body and quiet your mind. Dogs Clubs presents a holiday hoops basketball tournament for boys and girls third through eighth grade registered for school or club teams for $325 with three game guarantee. The tournament will be held at City College of San Francisco. The San Francisco African American Reparation, Reparations Advisory Committee cordially invites you to be a part of the conversation every second Monday in 2023. You may attend in person at City Hall located at 1 Dr. Carlton B. Goodlit Place or online by registering at the link below. Dreamkeeper San Francisco invites you to join us for the community updates every third Wednesday in 2023. These meetings are open to the public via Zoom. For more information and the meeting link, please see the link below. As part of the fall exhibitions, the St. Joseph's Art Society features works by visual artist Christopher Birch in Traversing on Geographics and Blade of Bone. Now through Friday, December 15th at 1401 Howard Street in San Francisco. Wu Yi presents the Holiday Pajama Jam for the Bottles and Blankets Pantry a Saturday, December 16th from 1, 8, from 1 p.m. to 
4 p.m. at 4900 3rd Street in San Francisco. Come out for the Lorraine Hansberry Theater 2023 to 2024 season. The season starts with a soulful Christmas, a holiday concert with performances Thursday through Sunday, December 14th through the 17th at Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture. Tickets are on sale now. Register your school's team for FR Saw Sawyer Academy's Holiday Hoops Basketball Invitational for boys and girls, fifth through eighth grade. The tournament starts December 21st through the 23rd, located at St. Ignatius College Prep, 2001 37th Avenue in San Francisco. OMI Cultural Participation Projects, The Wiz. Saturday, January 27th, 2024, at 7 p.m. at the Golden Gate Theater, 1 Taylor Street in San Francisco. The African American Arts and Culture Complex invites you to the Season of Black Art inaugural event, introducing October 2023 through February 2024 season at the AAACC, located at 6, 762 Fulton Street in San Francisco on Sunday, October 29th, kicking off captivating celebration of Black creativity and culture with special guests and performers. For more information, please register for your tickets. BSLT is calling on conscious individuals and organizations to sponsor our third annual African American History Bowling event at awards and awards ceremony. The awards ceremony will be held on February 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. and the following bowling and following the bowling event will be hosting on February 25th, 2024 from 2 to 5 p.m. For more information on sponsors, please see the website and the email below. Into Action announces the Black Culture Preservation Mini Grant Cycle 3 opening January 25th and closing on February 26, 2024 for March First through May 31st, 2024, you can get up to 9500 in funding for Black Cultural Preservation events in Tenderloin, Lakeview, Sunnydale, Visitation Valley, and OMI. The DKI announces the Senior Home Repair Program with an up to 50000 forgivable loan to loan low to moderate income senior or disabled homeowners residing in historical distress and underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. San Francisco Human Rights Commission has a regular bi-monthly commission meeting on the second and fourth Thursday of each month at 5 p.m. in the San Francisco City Hall room 416. You can also attend via Zoom. Fathers to Founders hosts child support clinics every Tuesday and Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 232 6th Street. Receive essential guidance on child support debt reduction, resolving driver's license holds, pursuing custody of your children, and establishing visitation rights. For clinic appointments, call the number below. DreamKeeper announces the Down Payment Assistance Loan Program. You could receive up to $500,000 for down payment assistance, up to $30,000 for closing costs and connect with housing counselors, lenders, and realtors. Walter's Wellness Group invites you to Sip and Paint Center every first, third, and fifth Friday, where you can unwind and set the tone for your weekend. Fueled by tea, creativity, and grounding. Hosted by Dr. Kathea Walters and the Walters Wellness Group. Join Fathers to Founders for Fatherhood Reimagined Therapy Group session held every Tuesday night, 6 to 7.30 p.m. ongoing, beginning October 24th at 232 6th Street in San Francisco. There will be food served at each session. APRI is hosting youth workshops offering job referrals, resume building, skill building, internships, professional networking, and community service hours at 1301 Evans Avenue in San Francisco. To schedule a Zoom or phone appointment, see the link and number below. Come out to Fillmore's Friday Night Market every Friday from 4 to 9 p.m. on O'Farrell Street, between Fillmore and Steiner for live music, barbecue, soul food, frozen desserts, retail vendors, games for kids, a Domino's tournament, prizes, and entertainment. Vendor booths are available. Get your COVID-19 booster and monkeypox antiviral pill treatment Thursdays, 1 through 5 p.m. at 330 Ellis Street, 
as well as Saturdays, 12 to 4 p.m. at 1221 Mission Street. The community living room open all day, Monday through Friday, breakfast 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and grab and go lunch from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. at City of Hope Cafe, 750 Ellis Street in San Francisco. The San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment announces Smart Money Coaching, which provides free confidential one-on-one -on -one financial guidance. The program is available to anyone living, working, or receiving services in San Francisco in English or Spanish with additional translation services as requested. Be a mentor in SFUSD. Join SFUSD's school-based mentoring program, Mentoring for Success. Sign up to volunteer as an individual or group mentor district-wide. Would you like to promote your business, nonprofit, or community impact? Sign up for our Hidden Gym Show, share your expertise on our Educational Thursdays, or be a panelist on our Sunday's conversation. Keep up with both sides of the conversations, latest shows, and community outreach events. Follow us on all social media platforms. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at bsotc.org. BSOTC welcomes individuals who are interested in giving back to their community to join us as volunteers. We value the positive impact volunteers can make and invite you to be a part of our mission to uplift and support our community. BSOTC kindly requests your invaluable support for our podcast and community engagement endeavors. We cordially invite you to explore any of our donation links as, you gener as your generous contributions will greatly aid us in enhancing our programming. We would like to take this time to acknowledge the Dreamkeeper Initiative and its support for BSOTC's programming. The Dreamkeeper Initiative amplifies the voices of and invests in San Francisco's diverse Black communities to reform public safety and address structural inequities in San Francisco. This Tuesday, Halloween, we will not have a hidden gem show, but you can follow up with us on Educational Thursday, which will be November 2nd. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, IO community. I know it's been a lot to get to, but I don't want to hear no excuses about what information you all didn't get. We've been putting it out there. We get it out to the community. Go back to our YouTube. Check out some of the events if you missed them. Um, but with that being said, we're going to go ahead and bring up our panelists today. Give Io a couple of minutes. I hear you sniffling over there. I know the cold is going around. Everybody's getting sick. Get out there and get your flu shots or whatever you have to do to stay healthy this winter season because it's going around. Um, but we'll get to it. All right. With that being said, we're going to bring up Miss Danielle Topkins back. She was here last week talking about this very topic. Danielle, how you doing? Welcome back. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back, everybody. Hi. Looking Happy forward birthday. to talking with you today as we look into prevention and, and some of the risks and support that we need. Yeah. Some great feedback last week, but looking forward to continue this as we close out uh, this month on breast cancer awareness. So thank you for being back. All right. Next up, we have Miss Jocelyn here. Welcome, Miss Jocelyn. I know you go incorporate some of that fitness and some of the things that you're doing to help the community out, to encourage them uh, to, uh, you know, stay healthy and use some of the tools that are needed to keep us out of these stressful situations that cause us uh, sometimes to cause these cancers to come into us. So, Jocelyn, welcome to both sides of the conversation. Happy to have you here today. Can you hear us, Jocelyn? Can you hear us? You're on mute. You're on mute. Okay, my bad, my bad. Yeah, I'm so glad to be back, y'all. <laughs> Thank you for having me back here. It's good to see y'all. No problem. Next up, we have the the one and only nurse that I know that's just a community advocate, uh, Miss Nicole Howard. Welcome back to both sides of the conversation, Queen. One and only nurse. You work at a whole hospital, sir. I know you love Thank all the you. people. I'm just happy to have you back, but I know you always advocating for good black health. So I'm just happy to have you here a part of today's conversation. As always, thank you for the invite. All right, next we have uh, Ms. Porter. Welcome to both sides of the conversation, Queen. How are you doing today? Uh, my, can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, we can hear you. My name is Dr. Ahimsa Porter Sung Chai. Uh, I'm very, very happy uh, to be with you and uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to today's conversation. And lastly, we have Miss Valerie Smeatley. How you doing, Queen? Welcome to both sides of the conversation. I am doing very well, and thank you so much for the invite. 
No problem. Have, happy to have you here and get some insight. Um, thank you all for being here. Looking forward to today's conversation. Before we get started, I'm going to give Io a second to read our statistics and some of the intro information for today's conversation to kind of give us a little framework of what we're talking about for community, and then we'll jump into today's conversation. Breast Cancer Awareness Month is a key time to shine a light on disease that continues to profoundly impact Black women and communities. While great progress has been made and overall cancer death rates are declining, research and treatment advances show breast cancer remains the most commonly diagnosed cancer among Black women. And unfortunately, Black women face disappropriate high mortality rates along with healthcare inequities that lead to later diagnosis, less optimal treatment and lower survival rates for this disease. The healthcare disparities stem from various systematic factors, including inadequate access to screening, biases in the medical system, and social determinants of health like income, education, and environment. During Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we bring these issues to the forefront and educate and empower Black women to take control of their breast health. This involves learning about risk, understanding prevention strategies, getting screened, advocating for quality care, and utilizing strong support networks. On today's show, we'll continue an open discussion about the challenges Black women face around breast cancer and how our community can address these issues head on, work to improve outcome. Here are some of the statistics. Black women have a 41% higher breast cancer death rate than white women. Breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed among Black women. Only 68% of Black women survive five years after breast cancer diagnosis compared to 84% of white women. Black women under 45 have nearly twice the incidence of triple negative breast cancer in aggressive forms. Black women in San Francisco have a <laughs> breast cancer mortality rate two times higher than white women. Breast cancer incidence rates are 20% higher for black women in the Bay Area compared to white women. Black women in San Francisco have lower mammogram screening rates with 62% getting timely screening compared to 77% of white women. Only 10% of black women with breast cancer in San Francisco get genetic testing compared to over 30% of white women. Black women in the Bay Area are more likely to be diagnosed later, more advanced stages of breast cancer. There are significant disparities in access to breast cancer clinical trials for black women in the region. San Francisco specifically sees higher rates of aggressive triple negative breast cancer among black women. Bay Area black women with breast cancer have higher rates of camaraderies than diabetes and negatively impacted prognosis. Ooh. Well, we, we could take it from there and, and jump in it from there. I mean, I think today's conversation is so important as we close out this month addressing black breast cancer. Um, you know, a lot of the myths and misunderstandings about how important it is to do the preventative work. And I think that's where I want to open it up because I know, Danielle, we talked about it a little bit last week. We talked about the food. We talked about the stress and different things of that nature. And then we talked about a little bit about the age because there's this perception in our community that young people in their 20s, um, don't have to be tested. And I know we know um, that's untrue from uh, what uh, Patricia talked about last week and things of that nature. But when we talk about preventive, um, I want to open up to you and doctor, you can lead us off if you want about how important the preventative work is, the lack of less stress, our eating habits, our exercise, those emotional functions that we need to do to keep us in line because we know stress is a big cause of a lot of the things. And then secondly, our environments, right? Most of these statistics that's pointing towards black women, a lot of it is the environments we live in, the communities we come from, with all the toxic harm that we have, especially in the Bayview um, with all of the naval uh, radioactive equipment and things of that nature that has impacted the community tremendously. And when you look at it globally across uh, not only this country, but across the world, how black folks are 
placed in some of the most harmful environments when it comes to uh, the industrial process and a lot of the uh, commercial and, and, and industries that really impact the environment. So with that being said, I want to open it up to kick this off. We want to talk about prevention. There's too much reaction in the Black community. We want to get on the preventative side of things so that we can stay in front of these diseases and these issues that impact our community. So I'll kick it off to you. Um, Doc, you could kick us off with it, and then we could just move this thing around popcorn style and get into today's conversation. Okay, we can't hear you. Go ahead. Uh, are you directing the question to me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, uh, the disproportionate incidence of uh, breast cancer uh, and the uh, higher death rates are um, factored by a lot of uh, things that have been well researched. Uh, it is imperative that we talk about the fact that uh, uh, women of African descent throughout the diaspora from uh, West Africa to the Caribbean to the United States uh, have a higher incidence of a genetic uh, form of uh, breast cancer that's triple negative, it's more uh, aggressive. So first and foremost, uh, we have to talk about uh, the genetic pr pr propensity that uh, women of color of African-American descent uh, have uh, throughout the world. Uh, and then there are a number of uh, inducers uh, in the environment, everything from uh, ionizing radiation to exposure to cancer-causing uh, chemicals. Uh, and then there are lifestyle issues like uh, cigarette smoking and, uh, you know, having uh, extra uh, uh, body weight and um, a, a diet that's not high in nutritional elements that protect uh, the immune system. Uh, the work that we're doing in uh, Baby Hunter's Point uh, around the breast cancer uh, necklace, you can pick up the uh, SF Baby newspaper this month and see uh, my article where we have identified a cluster of breast cancer cases in women who are living around the shipyard within a six uh, block uh, perimeter. Uh, some of these women are as young as uh, in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and there are other attributes of the cluster that suggest that it is caused by uh, exposure to ionizing radiation. Uh, but I do think that the combination of a genetic propensity uh, combined with inducers uh, in the environment that are very, very potent uh, and aggravated by ag uh, lifestyle issues as well as delays uh, in uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, contribute to uh, a disease that has such a disproportionate uh, impact on women of color and African-American women particularly. Wow, uh, very important information. Um, I'm looking to that article, definitely wanna read uh, more about that article. Um, you know, when we talk about the access, we know in baby particularly, um, you know, community just been hit from all of the waste uh, from the naval um, yards, um, you know, and this stuff is spreading around the community pretty fast. I mean, I think, I think it's been happening for many, many years. It's just more recently, more and more focus is on uh, the amount of hazard that is out there and how it's affecting the community. But from the community standpoint, um, when we talk about access to service, right, getting to the doctors, getting the early treatment, you know, during pa the pandemic, you know, there was a lack of resources that came to the Bayview and the Black communities across this country. You know, there was a time where the Department of Public Health would roll out uh, the mammogram truck and different, uh, you know, mobile resources to bring the community events to do testing on the spot. And it's kind of went away. And I'm trying to uh, talk to some of these folks to figure out what's going on. And we always talking about Black health and we talking about how do we create events to bring black health and health um, issues and resources to the community. Um, how much more now um, as folks are coming out of this pandemic um, and uh, understanding some of these environmental issues and then understanding these alarming numbers that's coming up with young people being uh, contacted with breast cancer and other cancers and asthma, you know, how is this now the time, you know, to not only put the light on it, but elevate um, the importance and the voices of the community to understand um, this, these measures need to be addressed immediately. Uh, 
Uh, well, if you're directing the question to me, the uh, pandemic uh, had a, um, a benefit uh, that was uh, unanticipated. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic highlighted uh, the disparities uh, that were occurring uh, among uh, uh, African American communities and other uh, low income and um, you know overexposed uh, communities, the overlap between uh, the areas of the city that were hit as hardest hit hardest by the COVID pandemic uh, it coincides with the areas of the city that have the highest incidences of cardiopulmonary uh, diseases and um, and cancers. Uh, so uh, we are uh, fortunate in that we're in an era of uh, public health now uh, where there's a great deal of focus on uh, health uh, disparities uh, and we can take advantage of those, um, you know, uh, of our understanding uh, of those differences. Wow, very important. I was Nicole, say too, go ahead. I was go ahead. Say too, um, working for the Department of Public Health San Francisco during the pandemic, I will have to say, even though there's a lack of support from what San Franciscans may know, coming from a different county, I feel like San Francisco is a little bit ahead of the game um, with providing those mobile services. When I was at DPH, they really recognized there were some disparities, but I think the concern was the lack of bodies to help get these things out there to the community, the lack of clinical support, um, the lack of folks that actually are educated and understand to go into the community and facilitate the healthcare needs. And so I think they recognize in some ways that there is definitely a need, but the bodies to get out there and actually speak to people that look like you and I and educate them on how valuable and important preventative healthcare is all across the board. I mean, breast cancer is one, but we, we could talk about a hundred comorbidities within our community that we know of, but we lack um, getting out there and actually doing the work. So hats off a little bit to DPH because I feel like they have some form of um, plan in place. I know I spent a lot of time at Booker T working with the young lady there. I can't, I can't remember her name now, but Shakira, Shakira simply. Yes. Like she was very much so passionate about that work, but one of her is not, is not enough. So um, if we had a, to clone this this young lady and get her to hit the pavement, um, not only in at DPH, but in other counties, we'd be one step ahead of the game. But um, agreeing with the physician here, there's a lack of um, just urgency um, of, of healthcare overall in our communities. Um, and just the lack of resources we need of bodies to get out there and educate our folks. So I, I want to I want to say something to that, and I think DPH does a phenomenal job of doing some stuff. But I also got to say, um, there's an issue that we still have in a black community when it comes to the healthcare system as a whole. Um, when we talk about the trust, when we talk about the treatment of black women and men when they come in for services. Um, what they have done historically with research impacts the community. I think those impacts uh, stop a lot of times from our community getting involved with the preventative work. And I want to get pick your brain and see, like, what does that look like um, to to anybody could jump in and take care of it? Uh, this question. But I mean, I think that's one of the biggest problems that I've seen. I've been doing a lot of work working with Kaiser, UCSF, a number of these health facilities. And there still is a is an issue um, when it comes to patient care, patient services, and how um, we culturally appropriate um, non-black physicians and, and nurses and clinicians um, working with our community. And I think as well as they've done a great job to try to outsource and bring things to the community, I don't think that they've made a great investment to really educate uh, the providers and the folks who are working with our community. And I think that's the disconnect. And, and they can't really move into the community um, like they should be. Um, sometimes it's the bias. Sometimes it's just the things that go on. But what does that look like to you all um, when we think about how do we reimagine what this healthcare system looks like when it comes to physicians and providers in our community to also get the movement of the community to get involved? Because I think that's where the disconnect is happening. 
I'll just say one quick thing. Um, the entrepreneur um, lifestyle that everyone is in right now is really kind of, it's great, but we need black and brown professionals sitting at the table, making decisions. I wanna walk into a doctor's office and see multicultural physicians, people that look like me, whether they're physicians, surgeons, um, OBGYNs. I think they're, it's really gonna have to start there because even when we educate our allies and our white counterparts, I'm gonna tell you as a nursing student, they teach us, we have a whole section on culture. Everybody in the class, no matter what you look like, gets taught about black people, Asian people in healthcare, they teach us all, but they're not you or I. They just don't have the same experiences. And so, unfortunately, I think we're really going to have to start encouraging folks and supporting them educationally wise. I know a lot of, I try to really work with my aspiring um, black and brown nurses and clinicians because they give up before they get there. And then we lose someone that looks like you and I behind with that white coat on, with that syringe, educating us before we make decisions and, and speaking to us from a cultural perspective. But I think personally, I know we have other, but that's where I think the disparity can, can make a big change because we can't, even educating these folks about our people, when I was doing vaccinations, in the city, all the color folks was in my line. I'm like, I'm like, they didn't even really want to deal with nobody else. And I mean, I seen about two or three looking like me. And I don't live in San Francisco. I live in Solano County. So I say that there has to be some form of familiarity behind those those doors. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I definitely agree with you, and I, and I feel like one, we got to figure out when we talk about this black ecosystem of resources, uh, we have to do a better job to fill, find out how do we collectively create this black ecosystem when it comes to our medical students, um, these pathways, because I think sometimes there's not enough resources, and this is where I lean on DPH and these larger city entities who should be doing a better job to recruit and help promote. Uh, the type of healthcare providers and folks that look like us in our community. And I think this is where they can really uh, do a better job. When we have uh, those pathways for young nurses and young doctors who are coming in there creating resources um, so that they can complete because we know the financial implications of going through medical school and nursing school, right? Being a little bit, having more flexibility. And I think it's a policy thing, you know, during the pandemic, okay, our governor here in California was able to uh, sign off emergency order to release uh, some of the nurses who were close to graduating and giving them their hours and things of that nature because we had a crisis in COVID. And I've been yelling this out. If we could do it for these times, we are in a crisis now. How do we create those pathways? How do we create that legislative process so that we can encourage this to get more black and brown individuals who look like us in our community to serve care? And I think that's just something that we have to really look at holistically, um, not just here in the Bay Area, but across this country, especially when we're talking about mental health. OK, the amount of school, the amount of mental health folks that I have brought on this platform to talk about how many extra hours they got to do and all these extra hoops that they have to go about just to get licensing and things of that nature. I'm saying, why can't we legislatively, you know, shorten up some of those processes, okay? We keep crying out as community, saying there's no black mental health provider. There's no black doctors. And we have these folks who are trying to go through these hours. Um, if they've gained enough experience to get to a certain level, how do we get them in the community to start doing this work so that we can have these providers and folks who look like us? I think that's the real call to action because I think we are in a crisis in this country. When we talk about cancer, we talk about mental health, the health system as a whole. We're going to have to get some young folks involved in this early, get some more bodies, let them work their hours off in the community uh, through these agencies that have the resources and the capacity to do this stuff. But that's the conversation we'll have a little later about that. But I just wanted to put that out there because I think this is where we need our lawmakers. This is where we need our uh, uh, folks who are proposing to make change. We can't keep having these major incidents in this country 
uh, with shooters and different things. And everybody just keeps saying it's mental health, mental health, mental health, mental health. But we're not doing anything to change the education of mental health. We're not changing the education and and and, and how we get these folks um, into these spaces uh, to do some of this work. So just wanted to put that out there. Uh, Miss Valerie, if you want to jump in, Danielle, go ahead. I mean, I'm, we're going to get it moving a little bit here, but I just wanted to open it up. Go ahead, Miss Valerie. I was just trying to um, piggyback on um, the services, I mean, in your doctors. A lot of people that I talk to, and I've been um, around the, 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 the world a couple of years, and um, it's a fear. Some the, the, the comfort level in going in and trying to get a doctor that can relate to you or understand where you're actually, or, or to listen to you um, is a challenge in itself right now. I mean, everybody's overworked, feel like they're underpaid, and it's just like an assembly line to get you in and out. But as a person of color or uh, of other races, you have a voice. From personal experience, I had a doctor who um, wasn't listening to me. She was just saying what, you know, read it like she was reading off a script of things that were medically wrong with me. And instead of coming at me in a space where I can receive this information, it caused me to have terrible anxiety and I wind up having anxiety attack which I'm still struggling with today. And so as I kept saying, this person does not have my best interest at heart and I can make a choice to move, to find somebody else to where I can feel like, you know, I am a person and in doing so, um, I left that doctor and there was not other doctors saying they weren't taking other clients, but I happened, God opened the door for me to um, get to have no another doctor because this particular doctor was on vacation on the day that I was supposed to come and she called in saying she wasn't gonna make it. So they was asking me, do you want another doctor? Absolutely, I wanna be seen. I, I've been waiting to be seen by somebody all this time and when I did receive my, my new primary position, and this is through Kaiser Hospital, um, she was so warm and so, and listened to me, even if it, even if I sound like I was whining or, you know, you know, just, just going off, she had the patience and I, and I asked her, I was like, can I please become one of your patients? And she was like, but I'm over, I, I'm not taking patients anymore. I don't have no more, I'm booked up. And I explained to her the experiences that I had with my, with the, the primary physician that I had. And she was like, go out there and go see my, my, my nurse. She's gonna sign you up. You're gonna become my, my patient. And as to say, you know, saying that is that a lot of people don't advocate. They don't think they have choices. And so what they do is they just don't go back. You know, they don't follow up. They're saying, okay, this person's not listening to me. So what's the point? Or they prolong, you know, I'm, I'm advocating a whole lot now about breast cancer and the importance of getting your, your, your regular mammograms. And listening to Dr. Porter, um, I know it's your middle name, but Emma, but um, I did genetic testing. After my um, diagnosis, I was diagnosed with HR positive, I mean, ER positive H2 negative breast cancer. And I received that information in February of this year. And you're talking about a phone call that you don't want to get and how mentally your mind is like, is this a death sentence? You know, am I going to die? And 
it was like the the support that I got from my primary physician and and then I had an oncology surgeon who were so inspirational about the choices that I had in finding my treatment and for me to be able to have some time to think about what treatment I wanted to go through. And I was blessed that because I continued to do my annual mammograms, my um, my cancer was very tiny, very tiny at its really early, early stages where when they did the biopsy, they almost took all of the cancer out through the biopsy. So, you know, God is really just been blessing me and I was blessed to only have four rounds of chemo. My biggest concern was I'm, I'm going to lose my hair and I'm going to lose my eyebrows and I'm just going to be awful and it's going to make me so sick. Everybody kept saying, girl, your hair going to grow back. Stop that. You want, you want to live, you know? And it was like, but when you're going, when, when you hear those words and you're going through it and you're like, this is a lifelong and, uh, and when you have to tell your family, you know, my youngest daughter, what she took it so hard, you know, she just cried and jumped on me like she wanted to climb into my skin saying, I can't lose you, mommy. I can't lose you. You're my mommy. And I have to give encouraging words to everybody else around me while I'm going through it myself. But God, I am done with my chemo. I'm done with my radiation. I am on my road to, I said, everlasting life until God decides to, to take me. So thank you for this wonderful discussion. And it is important for all of us to continue to educate. We know what the political ramifications are, but what we can do right now is we can educate each other on the importance of going in, get that mammogram regardless, just go. The fear, yes, everybody don't want to hear, but if you hear it early enough, you have a better chance of survival. And when they did further testing on the type of cancer they I had, it's a very aggressive type, which there was a 40% chance that it would reoccur. And that's when I decided I need to do the genetic testing because I need to inform my daughters, look, we have this gene. My mom died of bladder cancer in 2020. Hmm. My father died of some form of cancer. I, I, need, I still don't know what they was talking about. But anyway, my father passed away. My younger sister, that's 11 months younger than me, she had breast cancer in 2013. And I just didn't think, you know, it's like, okay. I, that was the farthest thing from my mind. But when I, um, because of me following through on my mammograms and the importance of advocating for yourself and the importance of making sure people listen to you is what we can do now. We can't keep saying we well, got to wait for other people to get on board and get the brick, the voice, your voice, you count, love yourself. So thank you for, for letting me share. Wow. That, thank there, you. Thank yeah, you. Very Thanks powerful about. and very inspirational. And again, this is why these conversations are very important for our community because it is you all who are showing your vulnerability, speaking about it, because we know in a black community, this was, an issue that we've had for many, many years when things happen, we just didn't talk about it. We didn't, you know, we had grandmothers and grandparents, they wouldn't mm -hmm. even talk about what they was going through. So no one even knew uh, some of the genetic things, some of the things that were taking place. We had family members in my family that died. We just didn't know. They didn't talk about mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. But again, understanding what we understand now, the level of awareness, education, information that's available to us is very important. And that's why it's important that each one of you here uplift your voice because there's somebody 
somebody out there who may be going through it. Maybe there's somebody who have uh, had that experience going to the doctor, maybe felt mistreated the wrong way, and now they don't want to go back. And that's some of the things um, that we really want to change in our community. And that's why I always make sure that I hold these healthcare providers to the highest standard when it comes mm -hmm. to care for black folks, especially mm -hmm. when our black women is talking about pain, pain medication. Like we have to do a better job because your experience, your interaction with that patient could be the first and last. Um, and it could be the difference making of them continue to get further service uh, to help their self out. So uh, very glad um, that you brought that out. It's very important. And I know Kaiser, it is a challenge to get uh, a good quality doctor. I don't know what it is about Kaiser, but all the good doctors are all backed up. So I'm a little leery of these people that still accept the patients because right, uh, most right. of the time those are the ones that we don't want to be going to. <laughs> but, but Danielle, I wanted to bring this to you because I know um, you had a similar experience of getting the news, breaking the news, um, you know, going through your process. And I know that's a challenge. Um, but talk about uh, some of the things I know with some other things that you wanted to uh, allude to last week that we ran out of time, but just wanted to open it up to you um, just to talk about some of the things that uh, you felt and some of the things that's preventative that you feel um, definitely our community needs to hear today. Yes. Well, um, for those of you guys that didn't hear, so um, I am lived in the Bayview for many, many years. And I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor. My mother had it and my aunt had it, had it and they both lived in the Bayview as well. Wow. Um, it turned out that it was not genetic. Um, I did get diagnosed during COVID. And I would like to say that um, for one thing, it seems in our community that um, a lot of things concerning health in our environment seems to be like a conspiracy theory. You know what I'm saying? People don't take it or, you know, this is why there is this lawsuit pending, right? It's just so hard for people to understand and know that. And it's because of politics and money. Um, my uncle is Raymond Tompkins. He does a lot of work with the environmental racism in the Bayview. He's um, worked really hard on this asbestos project, things that's going on to do the asbestos research. And he wanted to test black women's um, or just women in the Bayview, their, their um, mothers, he wanted to test their breast milk and um, he wouldn't even get the funding for it, okay? So there is something to say for like money and politics in, in that area, okay? So, um, but when I when I told some friends, when I had diagnosed and I, and I waited kind of late to tell everybody, it just, some people had just found out about it this year, but um, one of my friends said, hey, I researched and found out that Bayview had one of the highest forms of breast cancer rate amongst black women and it's just like why didn't i hear about this for as many years as i lived there and most people don't know this i think we need to go back to like boots on the ground handing out flyers and pamphlets and just getting the word out i don't i don't think most women know about this in the baby i did not had i known i would have been in the doctor's office getting my mammogram a lot sooner but i will say also there was a little bit of fear um, surrounding the mammograms because you hear that it's painful. It's just kind of like when we, with the colon cancer and men are kind of, black men are kind of cautious to get it. Does it hurt? Is it painful? And, um, you know, it's not, it's so minuscule to, to, to compare to the problems that could create if you just wait too long. So, um, so that's number one. We definitely need to go and get checked out, especially um, us, we need, black women need to go in there sooner. We have um, denser breast tissue compared to white, our white counterparts. And so when we do get our mammograms, it's um, often, uh, if we have cancer, sometimes it's hard to see with them because we have so much tissue. I was told by my coach that um, we actually need to get ultrasounds as well, um, just to make sure um, that there's nothing in there. So, um, you know, we could some often go as mi misdiagnosed sometimes because of that reason. But um, so I was, I was diagnosed during the pandemic. And then one thing you were saying about us, it, it kind of made health problems worse because every medical need took a backseat to COVID. You know, if you didn't come into the hospital with COVID, you just basically couldn't get an appointment. So there was a whole year that I missed treatment. And a lot of times, most women, when we go in um, and they do our breast screenings, it's during, um, you know, the time when we go to see our OBGYN. And sometimes we go in once a month. I was just told by my doctor, oh, you know, you can wait another five years, you know, and that's just when it comes to, and that times that's 
that's the only time, even when we're getting pap smears and stuff, that's the only time a lot of us get our breast cancer screening if we don't know how to check for it ourselves. So we definitely need to be going to the hospital and saying, no, I'm not going to wait five years, three years. I want to go annually to get my, you know, um, because I'm at a higher risk, I do want to go and get cancer screenings and checks. So we do need to do that, you know. Um, but I do want to say this. We as far as the doctors go, we can't assume that the doctors know everything. I had to, my, there are things that I told my doctors that they had no clue about. I was educating my doctors on things. And so we have to start thinking that they are the gods and they know everything they don't. Uh, we need to find our community as I did. I found my own community. I went out on a hunt. As I said last week, I found my community on Clubhouse and I didn't even know what I was looking for. I just needed help. So I was in prayer groups. I was in health groups and all these people got together and I met people, especially black women that had cancer. And, you know, one girl, told me her testimony of how God healed her supernaturally. I think she had either cervical cancer or um, another type of cancer in that region. Um, and so, um, but she, she told me her faith testimony and she got diagnosed at a young age and she became my rock. She became my friend. She was all the way in Michigan, but I leaned on her a lot to support su spiritual support. There was another woman who I met. Um, she, um, and like I said, she became my breast cancer coach, but she, um, had groups. She had groups of women that she met with and, um, she became a certified breast cancer specialist, but she said in her group, she was shocked at the amount of information that her white counterpart, the white women received compared to the black women received. And so one of the things in pieces of information was your alternatives to medicine, the type of treatments that you can get. Because oftentimes we think cancer, we think chemo, like myself. I went to Kaiser, I had a horrible experience. Um, I was sitting in there and for me, I didn't want chemo. I decided not to do it. Um, but um, the doctor told me, she says, oh, well, if you don't, if you, she didn't know what, I, what choice I was going to make yet. But I, I think she knew that I was, I, I, I had, there was alternative choices. I was bringing out my options because I knew there was chemo in pill form. I knew that I was watching how one man had uh, cured himself. He was a stage form and um, shrunk 13 tumors just off juicing. So I was just watching and getting as much research as I could. And when I went to Kaiser, they said, um, I said, so what about the chemo through pill form? And they said, oh, no, you're you're a triple positive. That's not going to work because you're a HER2 positive. That's not going to work for you. And um, if you can, if you decided not to do radiation, which I was kind of not interested in at the time, or I'm 50-50 with, they, and the doctor straight up told me, and this is a surgeon. This is not the oncologist. The surgeon told me, um, I will not agree for radiation for you if you do not do the chemo. Um, I was also told, um, one of the um, oncologists asked me, she says, do you have any children? And I said, no. She says, are you thinking about having children? Is this something you want in the future? I said, yes. And she says, okay, because um, we can see if we can freeze your eggs. And I says, okay. Um, so I talked to like an endocrinologist um, you know, fertility specialist. And the lady straight up lied to me. She, she told me, she says, um, so when is your chemo appointment? And I says, I don't think I'm going to do chemo. She says, okay, well, we're not going to freeze your eggs, which is against the laws. Absolutely ridiculous. And so I, you know, it was just, it was a horrible experience. Even with the radiologist, I told him, I says, I want to know everything I need to know, but just so you know, I'm not doing chemo and I don't want to talk about it. He still kept bringing it up. Um, so I went ahead and I got another opinion and people don't know, you can get as many opinions as you want. So I went to UCSF and had a bad opinion. That doctor was actually kind of agreeing with the first doctor and then told me, if you do nothing, you will die. And so one of the mistakes I made and nobody should make is you do not go in a doctor's office by yourself. You make sure you have support and people with you. And he told me that the triple positive was the most aggressive, which it wasn't. I told him, no, it's actually triple negative. I know it's aggressive, but triple negative is. And I told him why. And so he looked shocked, like how I knew the answer to that. But I had left there. I was really disappointed. And so my next result, I went online. I found um, Dr. Dennis Holmes, which 
which I was um, told about through my black breast cancer coach. Um, and Dr. Dennis Holmes is out of LA and he does a treatment called cryoblation where they go into your breasts and they take a needle and they freeze the tumor and the lymph nodes. Um, and so this treatment is not covered through, um, they still have trials. It's not covered through your insurance. However, um, the tumor would have to be less than a centimeter for it to be free. Anything, or a centimeter over a centimeter is $10,000 per centimeter. By this time, um, I got diagnosed in um, 2000, September 2021. Um, by the time I was going to go in to get my surgery, because I agreed to a lumpectomy, that's the one thing I did agree to, um, it was three centimeters. And so um, it was going to be $30,000. I didn't have that much money, but he did do lumpectomy surgeries. And so I said, you know what? Hey, I'm going to you. I'm going all the way to LA. I didn't, I don't know how I was going to get the money, anything just on faith. My family called, they all paid for me, my trip and everything, went to LA, got the surgery done. He was great and um, flew back. And I did, I was told that there is a chance it might come back. Problem is, this time around, because they they denied me alternative treatments, it did come back, and I did not know that. I um, so here's the other part that we need to talk about, and I don't want to take up too much time. If I'm talking too long, please stop me. Um, healthcare. My job did not cover. Um, I was not covered under healthcare with the type of job that I had, so I had to pay out of pocket. I paid too much money to qualify for Medi-Cal at the time, so I couldn't get Medi-Cal. Um, under COVID, I qualified for that like $1 a month, and that's how I was able to get my treatment. But at some point, I had to pay out of pocket. It went from $1 to almost $400 a month. And after just so many other alternatives and treatments, I like maxed out my credit cards. There's so many expenses when people get diagnosed with cancer. Um, I just stopped paying. I couldn't afford to pay it just for those few months. And so I was going to work hard and do what I needed to do, um, until I got, you know, I was able to get it. But by this time I'm feeling okay. But, um, I experienced some back pain and I just, I never linked it to cancer. I just, I thought it was from an injury from something else. But what brought me into the hospital is COVID. I actually caught COVID in November, 2021, later than most people caught it for the first time. And I went in, I said, I'm a former breast cancer patient. I don't feel good. And my back is pain and my back is in pain. They immediately did an MRI, found out that the cancer had in fact spread to my back and caused a fracture in my back. It was in my bones at this time. It had metastasized. It was in both breasts. They found the lymph nodes in both arms. Um, when I did the PET scan, my brain lit up. My just when you do a PET scan, parts of your body lit light up for them to test. Um, so they immediately did the um, uh, this test for my brain. I knew I didn't have it in my brain, but they but they tested it. Um, so they found out it was in my back, and it did spread to my liver, but it didn't cause any damage. So at this time, I finally was considering um, alternate. I was I was considering the, the um, chemo at this point, but I still wanted a doctor to give me options. So I told the nurse, I said, please, please, I need a doctor with options. If you tell me the doctor is only going to say cancer is the only way, I'm not going to go to that. They said, no, no, Miss Tompkins, we found a doctor for you. Um, so I wanted to bring it back to, I had actually got some money and got myself insurance <laughs> for affordable. And by this time it's like $400 a month, but whatever, I went ahead and paid it. And, um, and so, but just for that period of time frame, this is why we need really affordable healthcare. Cause this is, why do I have to choose? Why am I financing a disease? I never asked for it. just doesn't make any sense. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I got when I got the money and everything like that, and I went in for the treatments. Um, they found a doctor for me, and I went. I went and talked to his assistant. I sat down with him, and actually, really before that, before that, the doctor said, "This is moving really fast. Um, we need to get you started on treatment." I said, "Hold up," because I was at a new. Um, this is my third, fourth hospital. I said, 
I need to get my eggs frozen. She said, oh, well, I wouldn't recommend that you do that. It's spreading so fast and that procedure could take two months and anything could happen between that time. I wasn't trying to hear anything. I'm getting my eggs frozen. I went ahead, got my eggs frozen. It took two weeks. That doctor called me so fast. The process took two weeks. God moved on my heavy half. And because of Senate Bill 600, Senate Bill 600, um, pays for you, um, pays insurance companies for eggs harvesting for anybody that has a sickness or illness that may affect fertility. So I went ahead, got that done. And then I was like, okay. So I talked to the doctor's assistant and I told him about all the alternatives, but I said, Hey, if you're only going to do chemo hands up, but I do know about this, this, and that went in the doctor's office and I'm coming to an end. The doctor said, we will not put you on chemo. We will give you a pill that you have to take every day. And every three weeks, you come in for an injection, an injection of Herceptin and no nasty side effects. The only side effects are hot flashes. I said, thank God I could have shouted in that office. I said, hallelujah. Within three months, I was in remission. Three months. And it's been like six months. There, The doctor was like, all your blood, everything looks good. He was like, A plus is across the board. Things are seriously shrinking. Great. He was like, everything is A plus, A plus, A plus. And I just, I want to just stop there, but do what's in your heart. Because I'm not going to say that I'm anti-chemo or nothing, but everybody has that little, you know, you get women's intuition about a lot, whether it be a doctor, this or this or that. You keep fighting for what you want. And I feel like that's our story for as our people anyway. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Constantly fight. I don't really take no for an answer. If I know what I want, I'm just, I just keep searching for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, um, but that's, that's my story. I think the importance of everything that I've heard from both you, Ms. Valerie and Danielle as survivors is advocacy. It's advocating for your health advocating for your team, advocating for your treatment, not accepting what one doctor says, but making sure you trust your discernment, that Holy Ghost inside of you, that, that discernment in you to say, this doesn't feel right. Your body will physically tell you what matches for you. And having that importance of support with your family and doctors alike is so important. I I just commend both of you ladies on your fight for yourself. Um, especially as black women, we are told by these physicians, these are your options. This is what you can have. And especially if you do not have the proper or an extensive type of healthcare coverage, they're going to tell you, you have limited options. And Danielle, especially your story of advocating for not wanting to go through chemo and them trying to deter you and discourage you from getting your eggs frozen and telling you you're not going to survive. That was your tackling fuel. That was your tackling fuel right there. So I, I just wanted to ask you guys, um, both you and Miss Valerie, your support system, both your physicians and family, friends alike. With dealing with the breast cancers and you guys having both the different kinds, how important and how impactful was that for you when making your decision on treatment? When, you know, like you said, those days where you were just feeling like, okay, throw in the towel, let's not, let's not go through it. Let me just accept whatever it is. Um, how important is that support system and how what would you tell someone right now going through that and feeling like their options are limited for me um i i had to find the person that i felt had my best interest at heart and as far as family member and would be open-minded and would listen when I blanked out, you know, hearing different things. And that person was my youngest daughter. I She she says, mommy, after I got out all my crying, I'm with you 100%. Let's do this. So she went with me for each appointment. The first one, 
you know, when we talked to the surgeon, um, she took notes, she had questions. She was asking questions that I, I at a point when they, when they heard, told me I had cancer, I kind of blanked out for a minute anyway, but she took the, the, the lead. She kept asking questions. She said, okay, we need time to think about this. Then we talked to my mom. We, you know, although we in the same room, you know, there was certain things that I wanted to say, just, but I just, my mind was just kind of going different places. So just like Danielle said, don't, go by yourself there's strength in numbers and when you have a support system that um you know that the decision that they're going to make is just not off the cuff and they're, they're going to work with you for whatever is um the best uh felt the best thing for you because when they told me i needed to have when they came back with the the results from testing my um, the tissues from my my cancer. After my I had a lumpectomy also, Daniela, and after I had the lumpectomy, and then I had talked to my uh, surgeon. She was like, Valerie, man, it was so small. I don't think you're gonna need no radiation. I, you know, I don't think you're gonna need no chemo. She was like, I don't think you're gonna need no chemo. But I I'm not the last word, so. Me and my daughter was like, well, chemo is off the books. You know, we don't have to think about chemo. Then I get a call saying I, we need to have a discussion. And this was from my oncologist and saying that they, your results just came back from the tissue that they had, you know, did further on research. And your numbers are very high. If, it, if your number is 25 or less, we would say it's not aggressive, but if it was 25 or more, then we'll say, you know, it's aggress more aggressive and we recommend chemo. Well, listening to my surgeon, I was thinking, it's low. I ain't going to need no chemo, blah, blah, blah. So me and my daughter are sitting there. We we like, okay, well, we when do we start radiation? When the oncologist came back and said, no, your numbers are 40. So we, we both stopped. My heart kind of dropped. And it was like, oh, Lord. And she was like, if you, oh, she said, okay. So, you know, and then she started talking so fast and I'm, I'm like, Daniela, it was like, now you telling me what I need to do right now. Okay. This is what we're going to do. These are your numbers. We're going to do this. We're going to do your blah, 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 blah. And if you don't do this, I think you got to have a mastectomy. I mean, this is, this is how I'm hearing this person talk because I'm, I'm already in shock that it's 40, you know, that the numbers was higher than I thought it was going to be. But after that, I'll, this is all I heard. And she was going so fast. This is what we got to do. This is your choices. This is the numbers. We're going to do this. We're going to start that next week. And I was like, oh, wait, hold on. I said, let me, let me process what you just told me about this 40. You already didn't pass that. You didn't even give me a chance to say anything about it. You going on to the next step. So both my daughter, I said, she said, mommy, well, what do you think? I was like, I, I, I can't talk to her right now. I, I need to go. We need to go and we need to go. I, I need to go sit down and I need to process the pros and cons and this and that and ins and outs. And she sounded, the oncologist sounded disappointed. Like, man, I thought I had her right away. We gonna get this started right away. I mean, it was just like she was disappointed. It was like a disappointing look on her face when I was like, "Hold on, stop! I need to think about this." So I I came home. Everybody looking at me. Okay, what's her decision? My husband he works for uh, Peninsula Hospital, and he's a very gentle, quiet guy, you know. But he said, "I'm babe." Things, the, the medicine today, the modern, the modern medicine is better than it was years ago. And it's still your decision. He says, but I've watched nurses have chemo and come right back to work. We'll have their chemo sessions and come right back to work. He said, I've watched doctors go through the, the processes and they're doing fine now, but it's still your choice. 
whatever you decide to do. So I talked to my, my husband talked to me very patiently and he usually don't talk. My daughter, she was like, mommy, it's still your choice. But I think if we just go ahead and get, you know, I'm leaning to whatever, she, she said, whatever I wanted. I talked to my radiologist. He came back and he said, you only have four chemo sessions and you only have five radiation. So the odds of it returning is greater. So, you know, you may really want to consider it. I even, I had to talk to my psychiatrist. I'm talking to everybody because I needed to hear different views, different, because my mind was like, I don't, that was the last thing I came up with. I don't want radio. I don't want chemo. I don't want chemo. But in the end, I said, okay. They kept saying there may be particles or maybe pieces of cancer that's floating somewhere in your body that the radiation didn't get if we just do plain radiation so or or that the surgeon didn't take out and she may have missed something it never got to my lymph nodes it was just basically in my breast just a little tiny speck in my left breast so with all of that to say it took a village kind of i mean it took my village around me and my oldest sister was like well, whatever you go through i'll be there every day i'll cook for you i'll bathe for you i'll do whatever you want so they were all on board. My family was really on board to help me, to walk with me through this. And while I was going through it, because I had such a, a wonderful support system, it, it was, I didn't have that much anxiety. It was just like, God, everybody is with me. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to fight. I'm going to, you know, fight through this. But there was one part that um, I'm fighting with now, and it's the five years. There's a pill that you need to take for five years after you finish all of this stuff. And I've tried. I'm on my second different pill because the first one that they gave me, the side effects were so horrendous. Hot flashes, dizziness head spinning, blurry. It was like, I can't function like this. There's no way that I can go five years and feel this bad that I'm not able to really function. So I called my doctor and I was like, I can't, I can't take this pill. And before I can really get it all out of my, she said, stop. I'm listening to you. Okay, I'm gonna stop. We're not gonna take that pill. We just gonna wait. So I said, okay, let's wait. Let me let this get out of my system to, to make sure that it's a cause of what I'm going through and not just my anxiety coming up or something else coming up that is really the pill. So after I stopped taking it, my system started coming back together. I can kind of function. I was functioning much better. So now I'm on a different one, which the pharmacist, and I, when I picked it up, he was so educational to me because I was telling him I had bad experience with the other one. So he was telling me how to take this one, when to take it, you know, do not think you're going to go out driving and take it. You take it on a full stomach. So his education around what I was looking that I had to look forward to the next five years and how I need to administer it to myself helped out a lot. So I'm still struggling with the the pill. I don't I don't feel like myself. You know, I still don't feel like myself, but I I I, I I'm in a struggle every day to say, okay, this too shall pass. God is take this is just a part of my path. And I am a special needs pre-K a uh, paraprofessional with San Francisco Unified School District. And the kids bring me so much joy that it's like, this is this this is why God say, okay, you're just going to be out for the summer. 
But the summer's over. You going back to work? So August seventeenth, I was there. I, I I I was back in school. I was ready for my baby. They was ready for me. And they said, you know, the fight is on. So again, the village, the people, you know, and you have you have to not. I didn't want a pity party. Oh, what was me? Why this happened to me? Blah blah. It happened, and I'm getting past it. And my babies is helping me. My daughter is helping me. And so, thank you. Thank That's you. That's amazing. That's amazing. I want to ask Jocelyn, um, preventative and aftercare, as in diet, um, especially like Miss Valerie was expressing with the side effects and things like that. Um, Yes, environmental things that have contributing factors to us getting sick. Um, but what in our diets can we subtract and incorporate to help building the strong immunity? And especially in the aftercare, because those side effects when you're you're having to take the aftercare pills and or you know, just just trying to get back on get your bearings back. What are some things where it comes to diet, exercising, and lifestyle that we can incorporate for preventative and aftercare? Hey, that's a great question. Um, first thing is that I just want to encourage some of, of y'all here is that I wanted to talk about something too, and I'm going to answer your question. That's a great question, is uh, epigenetics. I don't know if you guys heard what epigenetics is, is that when you have a gene marker for like breast cancer or diabetes or whatnot, it's not so much that you're going to automatically get it, but it's your diet and your, your diet that influences whether or not that is turned on or turned off. So that's the, that's the, that's the cool thing about it. And that I wish that more people would know about this because then we would be more serious about our diet. I'm not saying none of y'all were, it's just that we didn't have the education to be like, Oh, because a lot of times when you're in the mind frame is that, okay, I got it in my family and you know, uh, that's it. That's it for me. I just know I'm going to get it. So then you don't pay attention uh, to how you eat. And a lot of times we get it. It's because we only know how we were taught how, how, you know, we were, you know, how grandma or mom ate, that's how they ate. And so those are the habits that you pick up. And that's why you do turn on that gene of cancer. And then, you know, and, and one thing about it is, is that I'm kind of, I'm the, I'm the health coach. I'm the bridge between the doctor will diagnose and prescribe, right? And then here it is that we need someone to educate in between to help people check in with themselves. Like we call it bio-individuality. That's one person's diet might be another person's poison. That means is that, look, just because it works for Sally doesn't mean it's going to work for Donna, you know? Mm -hmm. So that is another thing, like you said, Ayo, that, you know, we have to check in. How are we feeling when we eat this? How are we feeling when we eat that? Because I mean, a person can be allergic to oranges and the other person, they're doing just fine. You know? So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's having coaches, health coaches, and and people that are knowledgeable right now i'm getting mentor and this is how um a lack of uh we, we, edu we don't have is because i'm getting mentored right now by a lady um she's called the undiet coach but she she's a white lady okay she had a, she has a harvard degree she has a, a degree in gut health this woman had she she lost 130 pounds with the science of how our body works because she knew that she's the one percent that we you know that that's why white women are able to you know survive breast cancer than our black counterparts okay because we don't know and so this is my mission is to help educate black and brown communities that look grains are not even good for us processed food sugar it's called the gps grains why we like grains jocelyn what do you mean grains we we are taught to have it in in our diet but there are certain things in our grains that our body doesn't naturally like and, and it produces a lot of inflammation we don't know how to process i mean our bodies doesn't know how to process that grain and, and so like you talk about the 
cereals. You're talking about the flour, the bread, we're all of this stuff. People say, well, it's high in fiber. Jocelyn, it's high in iron. It's high in this. And this is where we get our fiber. Oh, you can get, let me tell you how else you can get that. You can get that from nutritional yeast. You can get that from grass-fed beef. You can get that from spinach. So it's not necessarily that we we need it. It's the fact that we're not educated because again, we are in this what billion dollar industry of food and they're going to push the agenda of grains. And what they don't tell you is that, yeah, okay, wheat's better than white, but what they don't tell you is that neither one of them is good for you. So at the end of the day, this is the type of thing. This is what I believe, and I think John, you asked, what is the solution? I know there's a breakdown in our in our in our uh, medical system. We don't have enough, you know, people to represent it. Really advocate for us, but see, we can do something outside of that. It's called health coaching. It's called health coaches that can be the advocates that can go in there with Valerie. That can go in there with you know and say, hey, you know, and help them kind of bridge the gap and say, okay, well, when she eats this, or this is what's happening here, or if like. Okay, what do I do? What do I do? And this is your your body that you're talking about. At the end of the day, there are so many things I can give you. Uh, you know, things that we can do, what to eat, what now. But again, it's individual. We cannot prescribe a certain diet for someone because it may not work. But yes, it might make work for some. And I see there's different diets. But I, again, it's all about checking in with yourself. It's about someone asking, hey, you know, you know, like, like, for example, I believe Valerie's talking about how, you know, they they're listening. You know, they don't want to listen to me or, you know, you know, there's some people that do listen. And, you know, you felt that warmness and whatnot. See, health coach, Coaches have that time. Doctors, they got so many people on the agenda. You know, they're like, okay, next, you know, next. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, okay, well, we got to do this A, B, C, D, and it, because they are taught to, again, diagnose and prescribe. So they have very mm -hmm. little knowledge on nutrition. So it's important. Yes, we do have to keep our diet intact because that's how we're going to be able to, what, turn this gene off, turn it off to be able to survive this thing. And, and you know, and at the end of the day, I'm sure that those that are spiritual, God will li align you up with that and tell you, wait, no, that ain't right no 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 that ain't right and listen to that and that's, that's what we do as health coaches we encourage that we say yes okay what else okay well, what about this now how did you feel about this so we're asking those questions so at the end of the day yes we do we we do need to pay attention to our diet but i want to also let the community know that it's not the end it's not just because you have it in your family doesn't mean you automatically have it you can change it you are in control by what you put in your mouth it's not and and again it comes down to our food sourcing too like where are these where are these cattles are are being right you know raised they're, they're they're getting fed grains right okay let me let me just share this real quick because i think so for example our cattle our cattle eats grains and corns and they chew right guess what they chew it they, it's not meant for them to chew, so they get abscess in their mouth. So this is, I'm talking about conventional uh, grazed cows, okay? So then you get abscess. Guess what? When you have abscess, you get disease. Guess what? You got to shoot them up with antibiotics. And guess what? You put that in your body. So that's why it's important to, it's not you are what you eat. It's it's you are what your food eats. What is your food eating? Because of what your food eating, guess what? That's going to be, that's going to turn on that gene like that. It's going to be like, we eating this conventional meat for how long? And pretty, and, and next thing you know, you're like, well, how, well I don't know what happened. It's, it, once you get to the point where you have to go to the doctor, it's too late. I, not too late. What I'm saying is we've already didn't do the things that we needed that is necessary it's because we have this lack of knowledge and lack of education that only if we need, we can teach in our communities. And then we have those supporters, those advocates that will go in there and be like, hey, you know, and tell you what you, you know, what, what is good, what is, I don't want to say what is good or bad, but what is supportive foods uh, versus unsupportive foods? Because we never want to say good and bad because, again, it's bio-individual. It might work for someone, it might work for someone else. But what foods are supporting you at this moment in time? So, again, this is this is what, you know, I'm called to do. And I believe that, you know, I want to be able to start a group of coaches that can help, you know, go in with 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 uh, with the doctor that can educate behind the Sees pre and after, before and after, you know, at the time to, to encourage them. And I, and I love it how um, I believe I see someone talked about a community that they're online that you can join to be a, a, a support you know, for what you're going through. And that's what it's all about. So you do have to dig, you do have to find, but, but again, you know, platforms like this, it, it helps to know, to hear and to know so that 
a way you can go about and you need to do for your life, for your children, for generations to come. Wow. It sounds like, oh, go ahead, Doc. I see your hand. Oh, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, I just had a, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, you guys have uh, touched on uh, some very, very important issues, and I certainly am, you know, very, very touched uh, by the uh, experiences uh, that uh, the two of you who have uh, gone through the trial uh, of uh, having uh, been diagnosed and treated for breast cancer uh, present uh, today. Uh, in addition to be, being, you know, UCSF and, and Stanford trained uh, MD with a PhD equivalent, I'm a medical researcher. I'm also uh, a certified clinical nutritionist. I'm also a NSCA certified uh, fitness and uh, uh, a strength uh, professional. So, you know, I do have a perspective that is, uh, you know, a bit different than uh, the average doctor. There are a couple of uh, important facts that I think that we need to uh, state uh, based on some of the most recent research. There's a huge study uh, by Alice Guan et al. Uh, it looked at thousands of women in San Francisco diagnosed with invasive breast cancer over a five-year period. It was a study uh, that involved about 10 uh, researchers uh, and it geospatially mapped where women lived at the time that they were diagnosed as well as specifics about their epigenetics uh, as well as um, you know, some other uh, uh, lifestyle factors. Uh, and there were two important facts that I think that we should uh, be aware of. Uh, one is that uh, women in Southeast San Francisco uh, were more likely to be diagnosed with stage two uh, uh, breast cancer or stage two B uh, breast cancer at the time of diagnosis. So that meant that at the time that they were diagnosed, uh, they already had multiple axillary lymph nodes. Some of them had four or five axillary lymph nodes. So that means that at the time of diagnosis, these women already had, by definition, advanced breast cancer. So uh, I just want to say that to emphasize the fact that if you are diagnosed with breast cancer and you've got multiple axillary lymph nodes, that is a sign that you need to take aggressive uh, action. And that may be why uh, you've encountered uh, health professionals who try to push you forward, uh, even if you weren't ready uh, for uh, you know, something like uh, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, if you've got, again, multiple lymph nodes, that means that the cancer is spread. And so you're going to be encountering uh, health professionals that uh, want to move more uh, quickly. Uh, the other finding of the Alice uh, Guan et al. study was that uh, African-American women were more frequently diagnosed with triple negative uh, breast cancer, and that contributed uh, to their uh, you know, mortality as well as the likelihood that they would have uh, advanced disease. Um, the other uh, point that I want to make as a nutritionist is that there are specific micronutrients uh, that uh, can be supplemented that can optimize not only your resistance uh, to cancer, uh, your resistance to infectious diseases like the common cold and the flu uh, and COVID, but they can also optimize your performance. There are people who are looking at nutrition in elite athletes who've identified that there are nutrients that can not only optimize sports performance in some of these elite high performing athletes, uh, but can also uh, reduce their risk of disease. And again, these are people who are looking at these athletes from the standpoint of their revenue generating potential. Uh, as a sports medicine physician, I often uh, think that we should be applying some of the science that we know about what is going into making superhuman athletes you know, to people who are living in high stress 
toxic environments you try to optimize uh, their immune response. Simple things like zinc, your immune system cannot function without zinc. Zinc is included in most of your over-the-counter uh, cold and immune boosting uh, supplements uh, for that reason. Uh, selenium is a micronutrient that the thyroid and the glandular system absolutely needs and uh, what we're uh, detecting when we conduct biomonitoring screenings in Hunters Point are people who have deficiencies not only in zinc and selenium, but the kinds of nutrients that you need to basically make your body strong. Calcium, magnesium, iron, these are frequently uh, deficient uh, in people who we're screening. So the last point that I want to make, and I definitely wanted to outreach to uh, Danielle because uh, you are uh, definitely describing having uh, breast cancer uh, at a younger age. I presume that you're, are, are, weren't you in your 30s or, or 40s when you were diagnosed? Yeah, and then you have the family, your mom and your dad. That's really suspicious for environmental inducers when you have a cluster within a family like that. Yeah, it was uh, my and, mother and my aunt. And yeah. so, but we, but it wasn't, gen we did the genetics test and it wasn't genetic. So that's why we, but we all lived in the Bayview. So that's right. Why. Okay. So that uh, supplements, uh, that reinforces my point that this sounds very much like environmental inducers. And I would like to invite you to come to the uh, Hunter's Point Biome monitoring uh, a foundation office. We're at uh, San Francisco Executive Park and, and pee in a cup, you know, and let us analyze your urine for chemicals that are known to induce cancer. One of the number one chemicals that we are detecting that causes cancer, arsenic. People don't understand arsenic is linked to multiple cancers, including breast cancer, but we are also able to detect uh, uh, biomarkers of ionizing radiation like uranium, cesium, uh, strontium, uh, thallium. We have a woman, by the way, who we screened who had elevated concentrations of multiple cancer-causing heavy metals. And after we screened her, she was diagnosed not only with breast cancer, but skin cancer and a rare cancer on her foot. We also have a young woman who is 27 years old when she was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer. We didn't screen her. I'm trying to screen her, but we screened her sister and her sister has just a heavy body burden uh, of cancer causing chemicals. Her dad died of colon cancer after being diagnosed with prostate cancer and her mom died uh, of a cardiopulmonary disease. So I do want to invite you, uh, you know, to undergo the screening. It could be valuable not only for you, uh, but for members of your family. Uh, and I also want to say that there is a, a, a legal um, uh, basis uh, for you uh, being screened. If you can identify that environmental toxins contributed to your cancer at a younger age, uh, then you may be eligible uh, for a legal uh, recovery. But doctor, I want you, I want you to put those resources in the chat for other folks in the community that might need to come uh, take that urine test. But you know, one of the things, and you know, I keep saying this too, and I'm glad you're here today. And hopefully, um, today's conversation and seeing um, the magnitude of this conversation and what we're doing to help educate the community, we also get our UCSF Galaxy folks. And I'm doing a lot of work right now with Dr. Rhodes at UCSF, Dr. Malcolm Butler, a number of Black uh, physicians and researchers, right? We have to start coming on to do these PowerPoint presentations because I'm going to tell you right now, I go to a lot of this stuff, okay? They come in here and they do all these PowerPoint presentations and educate. It ain't nobody in the room looking like us. So I'm saying, hey, I need my UCSF folks. I need my Kaiser folks. I need my Sutter Health folks to come on our platform to do these presentations so that our community can connect and get those resources and information that we don't always get. So that point there, I wanted to make that. So I want to definitely um, extend the olive branch to you. Maybe uh, one of these months coming up, we can have an educational Thursday where you come and do a PowerPoint presentation, you and your team, and try to get other 
other folks because that's the problem in our community. Everywhere I go in our community, especially in D10, the southeast sector of the city, everybody's like, I didn't, I don't know this. I don't know how to connect. All right. So I'm that connecting hub. I'm that bridge of uh, intersections connected with those resources and those informations. And I want to get you here so that you can make sure um, that we get this to the black community, because I know a lot of this research and what's going on is about the folks who've been impacted. And those folks in our community needs to get that information. Secondly, um, you being here is a good topic to kind of just really jump in before we bring up uh, Miss Farley here. Um, <laughs> this new this new age of doctoring is just it's, it's troubling for me because, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about diagnosing and prescribing. And, you know, even me as a patient, I just feel like something is going on with Western medicine. And I don't know if it's tied to pharmaceuticals and I don't want to make a big, you know, scream about this. But it's something about this drug pushing generation of doctors where the care, you know, when I was growing up, it was a lot more uh, doctors would like to check and do more uh, surveillance of you and checkups where now we have this this model of doctoring where it's, Hey, you have a problem. Let me give you this. And if this don't work, we'll come back and give you this. And I'm seeing this um, in, in a lot of situations, folks that I'm talking to. And as we continue to talk about advocacy, you know, I, I talk about the doulas. We had the doulas come on here uh, for labor. But I, I, I'm, I'm really looking at what doulas do, health coaches. You know, we talk about creating wraparound health care services. What does that look like? And I'm starting to hear more and more of like, we need more doulas. We need more health coaches to partner with our health institutions so that we can can get a full holistic look of the, some of these health causes that are really impacting our community. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, your perspective, you inside, you see what's going on. I hear it a lot. And, and even me, I've, I've, I've just with my physician, just, you know, whatever's going on, it just seems that we're not doing the, the old doctrine ways of like really, you know, inspecting and, and checking. It's just, hey, you, you saying this, let me prescribe you this and see if this works. How do we get out of that model? And I get it, doctors are backed up, but it's like, it's something about the pharmaceutical companies that are pushing the industry of doctoring into a different, um, just a different lane. And it's not connecting with the people. And it's more of this, we're going to try and react. Okay, I want to prescribe you this medication. This should cover these gray areas of symptoms. If it don't work, come back, we'll try this. And if it ain't this, then we'll, it's, it's like this guessing doctoring. What, what is your take on this? And how do you you feel as a physician and what you see, especially uh, dealing with Black patients in the healthcare industry? Well, uh, the major trend has been away from the community-based uh, sole uh, practitioner. Uh, I can tell you as uh, one of the only African-American women uh, in uh, San Francisco to own uh, a medical practice, uh, that it's very, very difficult to uh, you know, meet just the basic operational costs of a brick and mortar clinic. I've, I've had several uh, brick and mortar clinics and I currently have uh, two. Uh, so there is a, uh, you know, a, a trend towards, um, you know, working in, uh, you know, large uh, group settings or uh, hospital uh, based uh, operations. Uh, we've already touched on uh, some of the ways that we can uh, use physician extenders uh, you know, like your, your paraprofessionals, uh, people who are uh, represented uh, here. Uh, there is also a great deal uh, of evidence, uh, you know, Nicole uh, can attest to, uh, that shows that uh, nurse uh, practitioners uh, can function at a level uh, equivalent to, uh, you know, many doctors uh, and, um, you know, can do so uh, with a, a demeanor uh, that may be more caring uh, or nurturing uh, than the traditional uh, male-dominated uh, healthcare uh, system. But physician assistants, nurse practitioners, uh, you know, doulas, uh, health coaches, uh, these are all uh, effective uh, physician extenders. Uh, I worked uh, once in a telemedicine setting during the pandemic where it was expected that you would see a patient every five to 10 minutes. So that's the kind of pressure, uh, you know, the doctors uh, are under. Uh, it's very, very difficult to uh, do anything uh, in a comprehensive and in a, um, uh, you know, legitimate manner when you've got that, uh, a, a, you know, small amount of time to uh, work with the patient. I did want to compliment 
some of the conversation that was, um, you know, uh, we engaged in earlier. Uh, in a, you, sometimes you can't bring the whole family uh, and expect them to accompany you into a, a, a medical uh, office uh, as much as you want the advocacy. But it is important to write the stuff down, okay? Because when you get in the doctor's office, you're frequently bombarded uh, with information and you lose what your priorities are. So, you know, write down uh, three or four or five of the major concerns uh, that you have so that you're going in, you know, with the mindset about, you know, what uh, kinds of things uh, you want uh, addressed and the priorities, uh, you know, that you want to uh, deal with. Um, but, um, you know, there are uh, changes in the uh, provision of uh, health care that we're seeing uh, hospital ERs are losing money. So if you look around the city, you see all of these freestanding uh, urgent care systems. That is the uh, system that we're uh, gravitating uh, towards just because it can, you know, the, I, I think the cash register uh, 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 rings at about a thousand dollars, you know, just when you walk into uh, an emergency department uh, with any kind of problem, just because of the high uh, overhead uh, and operational costs. Uh, but uh, it is true, the research shows uh, physicians of color uh, tend to care for patients of color, uh, tend to be more responsive to uh, and um, available uh, to patients uh, of color. And we need to uh, you know, support uh, some of the freestanding uh, practices that we have uh, in the uh, community. Uh, the um, you know, healthcare centers in uh, Southeast uh, San Francisco, the uh, Marin Center uh, has the Bayview uh, Clinic uh, at the uh, you know historic uh, location uh, on Third, uh, uh, you know up near uh, Paul, uh, and you know they offer services and they uh, just need more uh, support and uh, you know more uh, a promotion of the of the services that they off offer. Well, I will help promote them. You got to tell them to reach out to me. But I got to say this because I've been working with uh, Dr. Charles I can't think of his last name right now at uh, one of the neuroscience researchers. And this is, you know, back to what you just said a second ago about um, as having questions right now, you know, through this conversation, we talked about the lack of av advocacy and then folks having that information. I've been asking Dr. Charles and a couple of folks, how do we create from, from professional providers like yourself and others, a checklist? Because I think some of the answers that you all know that can contribute to some of these issues that we have, how do we create that pamphlet, right? That we submit to our community and say, hey, when you go in there for breast cancer, here goes some of the things for black folks that we need to check. You get what I'm saying? Because sometimes, like you said, because of the health issues that we've had dealing with these doctors, this healthcare system, right? People go in there, they have this idea of what they want to say to the doctor and then they go in there and then they get nervous. They get shut down from the doctors and just like, no, 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 you're going to do this. And I, I keep telling these doctors, okay, we got all these black doctors across the country. And this is why I get so frustrated because I'm saying we have the answers. You all are professional. Why can't we put together this checklist for men, especially women too, right? We always talk about what men are getting checklists. Like these guys going to the doctor, they're just like, oh, let me do some lab tests. But they really don't understand all the things that we need to be checking. But we have enough black professionals. Why can't we put that checklist pamphlet for our community? Can we create something so we can say, here, here's something to empower you. When you go talk to your doctor, are you concerned about breast cancer? Are you concerned about colon cancer? Are you concerned about some of these things that we find when they're doing these lab tests? Here's some of the advocacy things that you should be talking to your doctor about. I think if we did that and be intentional to create this health change, just like buying a car. You buy a car, I tell you, after 10,000 miles, you got to change the oil. You got to do this. How do we create something like that for our community? I, I, I would love to see our black doctors and I started working with Charles about it and it's like, I get it, but it's like, we have to get something that we could get to our community to really empower them when they're having that difficult conversation with their doctor, when they're going through these screenings. So you all as black professionals understand here, if you get diagnosed with this, here are some of the things you want to make sure you talk to your doctor to look at. I think that will be very helpful for our community. I think it'll be very empowering. I think that'll give folks um, who maybe not apt to speak up for themselves, it will give them some pathway to have that conversation with their physician. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's a great idea, John. I think you're speaking specifically for um, DPH in San Francisco um, County, but I also think I wanted just to tell the young ladies there that had the diagnosis too, a couple of things that I noticed that they did that we all should be doing is, number one, we're, we're in this environment where technology is, we have really more resources than we had 20 years ago that we as the actual person can put our hands on. Back in the day, you couldn't Google nothing. You couldn't go to Clubhouse. You couldn't go to, um, you know, all these different like technology resources that some of our middle-aged folks and young folks can grab and get all the information. We need to be doing that. We do it for everything else. We want to figure out how to work, make an ebook. We go to Google, we figure it out. We go to Facebook and all these other things. When it comes to our health, though, we kind of get a little bit lazy. We kind of get a little bit lazy and we want to be handed a lot of things. We, we have like this, um, the health coach thing. I think that's great. Partnering with someone that is coupling the, the, the nutrition on a deeper level than just the standard physician. Another thing is all physicians don't know the same information, just like Danielle said. Are we seeing the right physicians? I know Kaiser to me has struggled with specialty physicians. Um, are you seeing an oncologist, a um, dermatologist, like all these different doctors you have to see, you can't go into your OB, um, you know, maybe talking about your cardiac health. You can to a certain level, but that's not their specialty. And so I think to the checklist for our people, for our, you know, what you should be asking is a great tool. Now, how do we get into the hands of the people that need it? So I create this great tool. I have this checkoff list. And then I got, you know, my people out here that are struggling with getting this information and then going and making their appointments and doing the things that they need. I really commend Danielle and Valerie because several things I said in their story. They advocated, they pushed a hard line, they used technology, they used resources. Danielle, you went to Clubhouse. You went to Clubhouse and found some people that had some knowledge that you did not have. And then you took that knowledge and you didn't even sit on it. You took it and then you went to the next part of that phase. And so I commend you for that. I think that the physicians here um, got some great tools. How do we then get the folks to go there. Well, to I'm going to tell you how they do it. They got to come to organizations like me. They got to reach out yeah. to the other organizations in the community. Now, I have to say this. It's great. Danielle's an educator, very talented lady. She has those access. During the pandemic, people in D10 didn't have Wi-Fi connected, couldn't connect to, to any of that stuff. So again, we got to understand the people that we are serving. And secondly, DPH, all of the major hospitals, these folks got data, okay? This is why, this is why I get frustrated. OK, because I'm in these meetings. They want to come here and tell everything about black folks is at the bottom of everything in a statistical category. But when it's time to come to the community, OK, if you understand this and you're doing the research, you know, where the black patients are going. We get the information where they're going. Black folks is going to, is to General Hospital. Black folks is going to these special clinics. Get the information where black folks go. This is why I get mad with this system, because they want to come tell us about all their data. But then they want to act like they don't know where black folks at or what they're doing. We are under surveillance community. They know everything about us, where we go, where we shop. Okay. This data thing that's going on, they know everything. So they got to stop playing. Like, where do we get this out to black folks? They know where black folks are seeking service. They know where black folks is going for resources and they got to do a better job to invest, to make sure that the outreach and the resources get to those spaces. It is a shame that a lot of our community uh, departments and a lot of these institutions that are dealing with health, they get to this point of and this is where the racism come in because it's black folks. and They don't care. We got to keep it real. OK, because when it's when it's a high population of cancer or any kind of health concern, because I'm going to tell you in Marin. OK, since we talk about San Francisco, you go to Marin County. If they got a high risk of cancer, different things, then white women over there get all the information. When they come to the doctor, hey, you in this area, we got a number of people that tested at a high rate. You need to be checked. But they're not doing that in the baby. OK, so again, I hold these very health folks in Department of Public Health. I hold these folks to the highest accountability because they spend a lot of money. OK, in our community. This is why I get mad at them when they want to come through me and connect with my community. Don't come in my community, want to do research on black folks, but don't want to give them no fun and no support. 
okay? Because they come in our community. And this is why black folks don't want to deal with the health system, okay? They want to come here, draw your blood, and do all this research. And then they, oh, we'll give you a $25 gift card and a hot meal. No, pay my people. Because again, if you get a Nobel priest pie, if you break uh, uh, some kind of major thing that go for all of our health uh, institutes, how much money is that worth to their institution? Okay, you get a doctor who break a research barrier, get a Nobel Peace Prize. How many billions of dollars do those universities get? A lot of money. And they did that research off black folks. So I'm going to just say this to those healthcare folks, to those city departments, they got to do a better job with the information that they have because a lot of them are sitting on it. And they know where the situations are happening. It's like COVID. When COVID came in the black community, they knew exactly how many black folks was infected, how many people were like most likely to get. They got all the information. So again, it's just a poor excuse to sit back and say, oh, we don't know how to get the information. No, they don't want to. Okay, there's a lot of um, nonprofits. There's a lot of community organizations that are connected with the community. But again, they got to be willing to make the investment. And when it comes to black folks, I'm just telling y'all right now, they don't want to spend no money on black folks. I'm just going to tell you that's what it is. So, so we got to change that. So how do you get them to spend the money then, John? Well, we have to organize and mobilize, okay? There's money okay. there. But again, if we're not together in unity, you can't have two people screaming and kicking. And then okay. they just say, hey, the squeaky wheel get the world. We need the entire community. See, this is what I talk about when we talk about standing up, when we talk about solidarity, when we talk about all these things in this city. It looks like advocating 365 days a year on all issues. The problem is when there's issues in black community, the other communities fade off. Oh, that's a black issue. We got to get all of the women, all of the women that's dealing with blessed cats in our city. We got Asian women, other women that's living in our communities as well. Until we get everybody on the same page, say, hey, this is a problem that's impacting our community, and we all got to show up together. We all got to make the legislative uh, uh, process happen so that it impacts our community. When we get there, we make change. But again, the only way we could push DPH and push DC departments is there have to be a unified front. And right now, that is the biggest problem we struggle with in San Francisco, especially when it comes to the black community. We can't get on one page on nothing. We got to get organized community, and we got to make sure that these folks who are in charge of this understand that there is a movement of people who are willing to uplift their voices, be vulnerable. And again, each one of you here today, your vulnerable experiences is what makes that change. Because if we don't hear about it, if we don't know about it, how do we advocate and push these issues to the front? And that's just really what it is. But we're getting short on time. Ricky Fairley is here. I want her to introduce herself to the community and uh, give her a couple of minutes to go over some of the things that she want to talk about. I knew you was going to be late, and I know we at the end getting close here. Uh, but I want to give her an opportunity to speak and uh, uh, reach out to the community. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. Oops. Oh, there you go. There you go. You unmute. Um, you're talking about all the things. So first of all, we do have a resource on a website called morethanjustwords.us. Um, Dr. Mo, my co-host on my show, and I put the put together a list of questions to ask your doctor as a new patient. It's more than do, more than just words.us. And you can call us anytime and we'll tell you how to talk to doctors because that's what we do educate. I think the other thing, when you talked about medicine, I missed a lot of it, but but so, you know, most medications, almost all of them, were tested on 50-year-old white men. If you look back at the clinical trials of the drugs that we all take for breast cancer, there were no black women in the trials. So the reason why we have a lot of these devastating mortality rates, 41% higher mortality rate, 39% higher recurrence rate, getting triple negative at three times the rate, black women are 35, dying at three times the rate of white women, is because the drugs are not, were never tested on our bodies. And so you say pharmaceuticals are pushing drugs on us. We're working with, with all, really all of the pharma companies that make drugs for breast cancer to help them design trials to recruit black women more effectively. And then we have a nurse navigator program to help them stay in the trials and be like the fairy godmother to stay in the trials. But until we get more black bodies in research, we're going to keep dying because the drugs are not working for us. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but, but they've never been tested on our bodies. And even right now, we only have about a 3% participation rate of black women in clinical trials for breast cancer. So we have to do better and we can only do it ourselves. So, you know, we launched our When We Trial program. I think I talked about it last year with you guys about a year ago, um, just to educate about trials that the fear is, first of all, doctors don't invite us to trial. And second of all, we have this fear of the unknown. I'm going to get the sugar pill and die. 
Well, there is no sugar pill in cancer research. You know that Advil you took last week? It was in a clinical trial. You know that heart medicine I gave my dog Harper? It was in a clinical trial. And when you break down the science into words people can spell and talk about, you're going to get a standard of care. You're going to get a drug that's already on the market. You're not going to be hung out to dry to die or something better. And you're going to get tomorrow's drugs today. And frankly, if you're a young black woman with breast cancer, especially triple negative breast cancer, a clinical trial is your best treatment. You're going to get better quality of care because you're going to get more scans, more people prodding you. You're going to get, it's you know, it's paid for. You get some creature comforts like transportation and food, but we have to have to participate in the trials. If you go to our website, whenwetrial.org, we break down the science for you from the voice of breasties like me, people that have, have lived experience in trials. And so far our plan is working because we've now signed up 14,263 black women for clinical trials in the past year. So, but it's not enough, but we know how to talk about it and we know how to explain it, but it's really just explaining how the science works and we're better off in the research because we have to change the drugs. We have to, it, and it could be as simple as using a different dose. We know that black women respond, have different side effects than white women to these drugs. And we really just have to do a better job and help pharma help us. And the only way we're gonna do that is to participate in the trials. And if you wanna get into a trial, we can help you. We have a trial portal to help match you to a trial. And it doesn't have to be drug related. It could be about the things in your environment. I just finished a trial, been measuring, I wore a bracelet for, for three weeks, measuring the, the, the chemicals in my environment, measuring the chemicals on my body. So there's all kinds of research, but we have to get more black women into research to really understand the science because the science is not working for us right now. It's not in our favor and we have to do, but we have to help them do it because they don't know how. And we just don't know, you know, we have to sort of get over these fears of, of, of mistrust. Really, I find that when I talk to women and just educate about it, the, um, you know, they say, sign me up because I don't want to die. You know, the only reason why I'm alive is because I took experimental drugs. You know, I think I told you guys my story last year. I, I had triple negative stage three. I did all the stuff. I did surgery, radiation, chemo, all the things. It came back within a year. My doctor said, okay, Ricky, you now have two years to live, get your affairs in order. And I said, I can't really die right now. I have a daughter at Dartmouth. I got to pay tuition. So me and you and some drugs have to work this out. And I ended up finding out one of five specialists that were researching triple negative, And she put me on experimental drugs and I'm here 12 years later. So I think we have to do this work, but we have to help people do it. Well, and this is my God job, you know, and I'm happy to talk more, you know, go to our website, touchbbca.org. We also just launched a site this year called Love of My Girls, G-U-R-L-S, for young women who don't have cancer to understand their risk. So I don't have any genetic mutations. We also don't get enough genetic testing, but I, I don't have any genetic mutations, but I have three generations of history. So my daughter who's 38, um, she just got a risk assessment based on our family history and, and just what's going on in our families. And she has a 34% chance of getting breast cancer. Mm -hmm. 20 is a high risk. 12 is normal, right? So so she's about to have a prophylactic, prophylactic mastectomy. She's now figuring what, what her perfect boobs are going to look like. So, I mean, so she can at least take the precaution because of our history. Because that's another thing. Our black families, we don't talk about health. We don't talk about it until Uncle Pookie gets his leg amputated. And then you're like, what's up with that? Or grandma's in hospice. And so we have to talk about it and put it on the table and get people to know your, her story and know your bodies and advocate for yourselves with doctors and say, you know, I want that golden rule standard of care. I want you to treat me like you would treat your mama, your auntie, your grandma, your, you know, your daughter. Cause if you're not, if it's not good enough for them, it's not good enough for me. But I think it is a fight that we have, unfortunately, that we have to take responsibility for and take to take care of ourselves. Yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the coffin. I mean, we got to have more advocacy, education, awareness. This is what today's conversation is. We have to have more people vulnerable to tell their testimony, like Danielle being here and uh, Valerie. You know, every time we have people speak up for what they've been through, it empowers someone in our community. But to those researchers, to the folks that want to do these trials, again, the investment that they need to bring yeah. to the black community to get these folks to do track. And I'm going to tell you, they call me all the time. John Harry, I need 300 people to do this. I say, hey, you better get those participants that's coming through me $500. I'm 
Okay, I need. Well, yeah, to have I, I charge everybody, and we, <laughs> but we we help them design the trials, and and um, and we do make sure that people are compensated and taken care of. But we do need to do the science. We do need to participate to get the drugs that are going to work for us, because right now they don't. Yeah, no, definitely. And then the other thing is when we do find drugs that work on black folks, then they don't get, they don't get passed to the FDA because they say right. it's only working on black people. So we've seen that too. But I mean, I'm just saying because I know the trauma of our community. When I talk to folks about surveys, even when I'm doing my survey, they say, John, I don't want to take another survey. Our people are surveyed out. So now you, we got to compensate people for this research and this data. This oh, yeah. Information that oh, we're yeah. Gotta we got to figure out. Um, Because I watch these RFPs and I watch all this stuff coming around. And when you look at the participation amounts of dollars, it's like, come on, y'all. You know, you're trying to do a $50 million research and you only want to give black folks $100,000 and 200 people. This is ridiculous. So some of these models have to be changed. Um, Again, if we want to get black folks to show up, I always tell people, you pay black folks, they will show up. I guarantee you. Um, But you have to make that investment as well, because that's just what it is. You know, it's hard to get them to come out and uh, be a part of this. But we got a lot of work to do. Um, when we talk about breast cancer, cancer in general in our community, we talk about all the things that are impacting black community, black folks, brown folks. Um, we gotta we gotta make a conscious effort of really bringing that awareness and education from folks who look like us. So I commend you and the doctor coming here, some of the other folks, uh, um, Nicole, because again, when people see black folks and you guys could take this uh, medical terminology and break it down to our community, it makes a difference. Um, and that's just what it is. And we can't talk over at people and talk at people. We got to give people a comfort. And I've talked to doctors, even in our black caucus at UCSF about, you know, how we approach patient care and patient. And we can't have all these things. Everything's a death sentence because that just turns people off. Hey, we got some real concerns and this is what we got to do. And I just think sometimes language and, and, and how we uh push the narrative about these uh, concerns is very important as well because we don't want people shut off and we know the importance, um, but we got to make these spaces and these places that we're doing these trials and research very comfortable for these folks. And they got to understand when they're dealing with black folks, that's just how we are sometimes. We can't change. They're in a rush. They want to get in and get out. So I'm always talking about how do we intentionally provide service, especially at UCSF, especially at Kaiser, when we're trying to get this to, uh, these folks to come in here. How do we be intentional to get the people in and out? Um, because I'm going to tell you, it's frustrating when you go to a doctor and your appointment's at 4 o'clock and you don't get seen at 6. I'm just telling you, most black folks, they walk it out the building, okay? That's just what it is. But we have to be intentional and understand and I think with technology and the understanding of how uh, we have all these information to find what times work for people and and how many people are coming to really be strategic and plan for this stuff. And I see it so many times that our institutions aren't intentionally, you know, putting things in, 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 in perspective for community. You know, if you got this research or this trial that's going on and you have something that's impacting the community, you see 40, 60 people signing up to come. That's where the intentionality has to come in. Hey, we got this many people. I need to make sure we got this many doctors so these folks ain't waiting. So it's it's a conscious effort that we have to do. And it's that's just dealing with our people. But yeah. um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one more thing. We have a great support group um, in Oakland that... Um, at Stanford in Emeryville that meets every month. And um, if you email me, I can get you the information. I'm not sure what Saturday it is, but we have like a live breast cancer support group. It's run by this amazing um, breast surgeon, Candace Thompson. She's 32 years old. She's fresh out of, out of, you know, out of residency. And she has a great, great community event every month where she just has women talking to each other. So I can get you more information about that, but it's at the Emeryville um, Stanford location. In Oakland, definitely. I'll have my team in the back, they'll reach out to you. Let's get yeah. that out to the community. Right. And Ricky, right. um, even though we're getting out of here today, maybe we can reach out to you later this year before the end of the year. We can get Anytime. you to come back on and do a PowerPoint presentation to educate community about the Stanford location, what they're doing, so that sure. we can get more of the people here locally involved. Um, and that goes for anybody. Any information we need to get this out to our community, we have to make this a priority. And uh, it takes all of us to bring these resources to meet at these different yeah. intersections. Yeah. But with that being said, we are running out of time. We got to get out of here. I'm getting text messages. Get off. It's time to go. It's been two hours. Okay. We got to get out of here. But before we go today, I want to let everybody give an opportunity to give out any shout outs, any people that walk you through the process or 
whatever you want to do, but leave the word, uh, community with a parting word before we get out of here today, because it's important. Um, these conversations, they go so fast. There's so much information. Um, but sometimes before we check out, just give the most important things to our community. And then if you have any shout outs, any uh, things that you're doing that you want people to follow, put it in the chat. We'll get it on there um, and we'll just move left to right. We'll start with you, Danielle. And we just move around until we get everybody. Okay, thank you. I just want to say for don't get the cheapest type of insurance. If you can afford to get a PPO plan, get a PPO plan. Please invest in that. Um, it'll give you more options. That's that's how I was able to choose the doctor I wanted to go to, go to all the way to um, LA and they pay for it. And I was able to see an integrative oncologist, which we don't uh, didn't have the time to talk about. The integrative oncologist studies not just Western medicine, but Eastern medicine alternatives. I was able to see a naturopathic oncologist that specifically deals with how to kill tumors naturally. Um, and then you have your you know primary oncologist. So I was able to compare notes and things like that and just have more choices and options because I didn't go with the cheapest plan. So we have to just invest in our own health. And I would just encourage everybody to invest in their own health, get yourself checked and screened. We already talked about genetics testing and things like that. And um, just don't, don't go for the cheap plan. Your health is important. And always just trust your heart. I left my information. Anybody have any questions or comments, you can come see me. Thank you. Man, thank you, Danielle, for being here again today, two weeks, and being vulnerable, telling your story. Again, the importance of advocacy. You are uh, that person that has done it. Community, there's opportunities. Advocate for yourself. Continue to uplift and reach out. Thank you again for being here. Yep. And I want to say this last one. I'm sorry. Right. I just found out three weeks ago. My doctor never told me. I was a stage four cancer. So I just want to say there is life and hope after stage four cancer. I went from a stage one to a stage four in just le in, with less than a year. But there's hope. So do never lose hope and give up. Thank wow. you. Wow. Very inspiring. Thank you very much for that, Danielle. Miss Ricky, you want to give any shots out or you want to give any parting words to the community? Sure. There? Um, know your her story. Know your normal. Um, you know, check the breasts that you love. I know you have a pair on a monthly basis. And, <laughs> um, and, and know that anyone who isn't bringing you joy in your life is probably a cancer that needs to go. Your peace is non-negotiable. Oh, I like that. That's very popular. There you go. Cats, I got some cats I got to cut. <laughs> thank you very much for giving that. That's very, very important. Uh, the doctor, Ms. Uh, Marsha Porter, uh, any part of words you want to leave with the community? Anybody you want to sure. give? I just wanted to simply uh, summarize that the current status of research in San Francisco shows that the highest uh, incidence and prevalence uh, of breast cancer uh, is uh, among white women. Uh, but if you look at women diagnosed with uh, breast cancer under the age of 50, uh, the incidence in African-American women uh, doubles. Uh, African-American women also have a higher uh, death rate uh, from uh, breast cancer. Uh, breast cancer is without question uh, factored by uh, triple negative uh, uh, genetic uh, predisposition as well as important inducers uh, like exposures to uh, chemicals. There's research that shows that if you look at Superfund proximity, uh, people of color more often live uh, in uh, settings where they are close to federal Superfund sites, brownfields, other contaminated uh, properties, and may also be exposed to contaminants uh, in their uh, home environment. Uh, but the um, area that we're most responsible for are uh, the um, inducers uh, that are related to our lifestyle, the things that we can change, uh, smoking cessation, trying to keep our weight down, uh, exercising, and optimizing a, a diet that is important in the nutrients that are essential for bolst bolstering uh, our immune system and our uh, bodily integrity. Wow, very important stuff. Hopefully we can get you to come back and do a, a nutrition presentation to help our community so they understand what they could be utilizing to eat better. We know that's a problem in our community, and mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that we can get you back to do that. But thank you for being here. Thanks for bringing sure. your expertise and just anything that we could do to help, any uh, trials or anything that you all are doing at UCSF that you want us to get to the community. Make sure you email us those flyers, that information, and we'll get it out to the community. Sure. 
All right, thank you very much. Miss Valerie, go ahead and give the community support role. Uh, uh, okay. Strong sister. I want to give a shout out to my baby daughter, Sierra. And I want to give a shout out to Ayo. That's one of my parents. And I just want to say I have a girlfriend. She was a double, two-time breast cancer survivor. And she is phenomenal. She's living her life to the fullest. And one thing that she told me, and I didn't get a chance to really do it, is she said, when they call you to tell you whether or not you have breast cancer, do not allow them to tell you over the phone. You tell them you want to come in and you want to face-to-face -face discuss it because they don't know where, where you are when you're receiving this information. When I received the call, I didn't even get to say hello very well, you know, fast enough before you said you got breast cancer. And I was playing with my granddaughters. It was the day after Valentine's Day, a day I'll never forget. But it is what it is. I got through it. Stay positive. Even if you get this diagnosis, that's what I tell them. Early prevention. Get your breasts. Get your mammograms. Don't be afraid to speak up. Keep positive. Whatever the results may be, you say, I'm going to get through this. And just like um, Ricky said, better. Um, you got to have nutrition. You got to have a, a you change your lifestyle if you have to, to, to stay strong, to keep your body strong and keep negative. And I don't know if it was Dr. Alma or Dr. Ricky, keep negative people away from you because that stress is a, is deadly in your recovery. So keep the stress away. Keep them negative people. Bong, 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 bong. Just get them out your life. Thank I'm you like for having me. Hey, thank you for being here. I like that. We got a lot of negative people in our community. We got to cut them off. Community. Cut them off. We got to kill the cancer. <laughs> All right. With that being said, Miss Jocelyn, go ahead and give some feedback to the community before we get out of here today. You know what? I think I'm more inspired by the conversations to be part of the solution because you know, I almost didn't come today because I was like, I'm tired, you know, this and that. But, you know, all that did this conversation is just inspired me to do be the solution, those pamphlets, those advocates, you know, creating an organization that would do that for people that don't really know, but want to and looking for, you know, information that is relevant to them, that is not just self-diagnosis, but more so of, hey, you know what? you know, wrapping around them and say, yes, that's yes. You know, having that confidence when they go, you know, to the doctor, or even if they're trying to get on a healthy lifestyle diet, having someone next to. So I think more so, I just want to say I'm more inspired than anything. I just want to give it up to my creator, the God that it, that made that, hey, say, hey, you getting on a day. You know, to be able to hear those that have been diagnosed from the doctors to the nurses to the people that are already doing it. So I want to be more part of the solution and doing more. And um, so I'm, I'm on that journey. It's just a, it's just a confirmation for me, John. Wow. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having the time. I know it's tired. I'm tired too, but we here, we got to make sure that people get the information. So appreciate you being here and uh, all the stuff that you're doing with your health coaching and, and making sure our community get fitness and food. Right. Uh, so just appreciate you and thank you for having here. We got to get you before the end of the year to do a, another presentation on food and eating and stuff like that. So we'll be reaching out. Miss Nicole, my partner, my partner. What's going no, on, Miss Nicole? No, no. <laughs> um, thank you again. This is always a great experience. Um, I would like to give my parting words. As part of my mission has been to really kind of bring in the young melanin clinical folks that have a passion for healthcare. We need you guys. We need people that look like us to have a seat at the table in them DPH rooms when they handed out money and they handing out stuff. We need people to look like us to speak up. Um, I actually am going to be hosting probably 2024 in San Francisco, a meet and greet where I'm going to be asking seasoned black providers 
to partner up with student providers and to actually be a mentor because they need us to champion that mental note that says stop and they ain't got no money and they can't, you know, they need a little extra money here for books or whatever. But I'm actually working with a group of folks right now and we're going to put on this meet and greet where I'm going to purposely and intentionally partner these young folks that are striving to have a seat at the table clinically to be there. We need that. And the last time I was on both sides of the conversation, it was just, it hurt me so bad when one of the gentlemen was like, I don't see no black doctors out there. I just, it's not a lot. And it just, that's, that's unacceptable. And we need, we can change that. And so until then, until we get to match the numbers with these other folks, great platforms like this that can provide a liaison to get us through and get us at a seat at the table is great. So thank you again, Mr. Henry, Ms. White. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again. I'm privileged. I'm honored to be on here with you. Every time I look up, there's some more credentials behind your name. Keep going. Black Girl Magic is happening. You get what I'm saying? Just We got some very intelligent people around here. I'm honored. Thank you. And I know your advocacy for Black folks and Black women health and man health is important. And thank you for all you do behind the scenes fighting for the community. We need all of the voices of other people to be heard to uplift so we can change this narrative about this health care system that we think is destroyed our community. We need to build it up so that we can help our community. So thank you again. Sister Io, it's up to you. Give me a wrap up today. What's the call to action, Queen? Um, I just need to take a minute and just take all of this in. This Black woman excellence. This panel was phenomenal today. What a way to wrap up breast cancer awareness and domestic violence awareness with this amazing, amazing show today. Um, not only informative, but inspirational. Like Jocelyn said, I, I am encouraged. I am motivated. I You lit a fire under me, each and every one of you, from your personal stories, from your, your professional experience. I am encouraged to be a part of the solution in a way of advocacy, sharing my own testimony, in every way possible to get out there and get the information to our community. Um, Nicole, I commend you. I, I agree with you of being able to have familiar, familiar faces in those doctor's offices that will give us the comfort as Black women and men going in there to understand that you are not just seeing me as another number. You're not just seeing me as patient number 000 or whatever my health code number is. You see me as a person and you can actually communicate with me about my health and showing me nutrition, showing me options, showing me advocacy for myself, which is so important. Um, wraparound health care, that is so important. The follow through is so important. Finding your community, as Danielle was so um, advocating, advocating for herself to do, making sure that you have that support system, not just only in your doctor's offices, but after that as well. Um, what else can I say? Those questions, that is a perfect. Thank you so much for that information, Miss Ricky, that those questions are available to our men and women going into these doctor's offices. If you do not have the support for someone to go with you or to even have the thought process on what questions to ask, these things are available to you in our community and making sure that you cut those cancerous people and places and environments, work work environment. It can be whatever it is, not just about the places you live, the places you frequent, all of those things. Cutting that cancerous system out of your life is so important because your mental, your emotional, your physical, and your spiritual are all aligned and your body will tell you. So make sure that you're taking care of you first and being that guiding light for everyone else in our community. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you for putting that together. Um, I just want to say this before we leave, before I give the benediction to the people today, 
We've been blessed with some amazing, powerful women who spoke up. When we talk about amplifying the voices of the people, changing the narrative, it starts with the very people in the community. Today, you heard from the power. You heard today the resilience of women. Today, come here to show and let the community know that you can overcome. When you get the diagnosis, the dis-ease that we talked about, you can overcome it. It takes everyone in our community. It takes the power, the unity of the people to shift, to make the change. You can do it. You must uplift your voice. You must be the advocate for those who can advocate for themselves. There's been some experiences that some folks have went through. Listen to the people. Find a way. Ask the question. Don't be ashamed. It takes all of us. This is a community issue. We must do our part. For all of the folks who are living in those high environments of toxicity, we have to do our part to do extra to check our health, check our well-being. Sometimes when we feel it, sometimes when we hear it, when we see it, we have to tap in to find out what it is. We heard from Ricky. The trials are happening. There's research going on. I need my community, all of the women and the men of our community to find out where are these trials happening. The only way we can bring change for our community, we have to get involved. I keep telling folks, we can no longer sit still and wait for the magic pill. We can no longer sit and wait for the person that's coming to save us. We must inflict ourselves into all of the things that are impacting our community. We can do this. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort, but we must organize. We must mobilize. We must do this in a uniform way to make sure that every voice, every experience in this healthcare system is uplifted and heard. We can do it. Our young people are the very people that we need to engage with. We must bridge the gap. I heard Nicole said, the elders, the doctors who've been doing it, the experience, partner with our young people, be a mentor. Let's work together to change the narrative. Black faces and black spaces is needed at all locations of our healthcare entity. The statistic says one number, but if we do our part to do the preventative work community, we can change those numbers. We got to continue to uplift our healthcare professionals. We must be a part of the process so that we can bring healing home back to our community. It starts with eating. It starts with dieting. It starts with our mental health capacity. Nothing be, can be done if we don't get that part of our being in order. Find you a coach. Find you a doula. Find someone who can inspire you, to encourage you, to make the change that you need in our life. Sometimes we have to remove the fast food. Sometimes we have to remove the junk food, the processed food. Sometimes we have to do the things that we're not comfortable with to get a different result. Change the narrative means we have to be in sync. We have to do something together if we want to change this data. Today is the day we will start. Even at the end of this month of breast cancer awareness, we will continue to uplift and highlight and make sure that this conversation doesn't just go away at the end of this month. We must champion this through every month to continue to highlight the risk and continue to be brave to tell our stories even in the dis-ease of re receiving this information. We can do it if we champion together. We can make a difference. Let's do that today, community. Thank you all for tuning in today. Our next live show will be Thursday. Okay, community, we will not have a show this Thursday. It's Halloween. We want people to trick or treat, take their kids out and enjoy. I don't want y'all to tune in and see what we talking about. We'll hold the hidden gems for next week. But this Thursday, make sure you tune in for our next educational segment again. We will continue to intentionally bring the professional folks to come here to educate our community with the information that sometimes we just don't get in our community to help advance the community so that we can organize, mobilize, and make change in our community. And we'll have another uh, segment next Sunday of our Sunday conversation as we continue to tackle the issues that impact the black and brown communities. We will uplift those topics. We will put the light, the burning light on the issues that impact our community so that we can talk about it. Every time we hear mental health and we talk about the change, they always say, if you just get it out there, if you communicate it, get it out of your chest, the change will begin. We believe through communication, a healing process begins. That's what we believe here at both sides of the conversation. Looking forward to seeing you all in the community as we continue to mobilize and move around to impact the black and brown communities in our community. So with that being said, good night now, good community. Go get checked. Make sure you find out. Do a mammogram. I don't know. Do something. Be inspired today and change the narrative. I'll see you all this Thursday. Have a blessed evening, everybody.